Just before we begin, can I remind members and witnesses and those in the public area to make sure the mobile phones are completely turned off, please, as they interfere with the uh, broadcasting services here, and to make sure they remain off for the duration of the meeting. Uh, today we're dealing with the regulation of veterinary practices uh, in veterinary medicine and ownership of the veterinary practice. I'd like to welcome Veterinary Council of Ireland, Mr. Pater O'Scannell, President, and Ms. Neve Muldoon, Registrar and CEO. And thank you for coming before the committee today to discuss the issue of regulation of practice of veterinary medicine in the context of, co of corporate ownership in Ireland. Um, I'd also like to wish uh, Ms. Muldoon every success in her recent appointment, uh, and I'm sure we'll be seeing plenty of you over the next duration, hopefully many years to come. Uh, before we begin, I want to bring to your, your attention witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence you give to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice the effect that, where possible, should not criticise and make charges against any person or entity by name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of long style and parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on and criticise and make charges against either person outside the House or an official either by name or in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Ms. Baldoon, I understand you're making the opening statement. That's correct, Chair. Thank you. Chairperson, Deputies and Senators, I am Neave Muldoon, Registrar and CEO of the Veterinary Council of Ireland, and I'm joined today by Mr. Pather O'Scannell, President of the Veterinary Council. On behalf of the Veterinary Council, I welcome the opportunity to discuss this important issue of corporate ownership of veterinary practices with the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And I would like to thank you for the invitation to speak before you today. I will say a few brief words about the role of the Veterinary Council, as this is very relevant in the context of the discussion today. The Veterinary Council is the statutory body responsible for the regulation and management of the veterinary professions being veterinary practitioners and veterinary nurses in Ireland. The Veterinary Council of Ireland is a statutory body set up under the Veterinary Practice Act 2005, as amended, and is under the aegis of the Minister of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. The principal function of the Veterinary Council is to regulate the practice of veterinary medicine and veterinary nursing in the Republic of Ireland in the interest of animal health and welfare and in the interest of veterinary public health. The functions of the Veterinary Council include protection of the public through the supervision of veterinary education, the maintenance of the register of veterinary practitioners and nurses, the registration of veterinary premises, and through disciplinary action in cases of professional misconduct. The Veterinary Council ensures that all registered persons meet the necessary standards in terms of education, skill, competence, and professional conduct to perform their duties in accordance with the prescribed codes of professional conduct and ethics and in accordance with legislative requirements. Any practitioner must be registered with the Veterinary Council to practice as a veterinary practitioner or a veterinary nurse. The Veterinary Council safeguard access and maintenance of the register with 2,842 veterinary practitioners and 935 veterinary nurses currently registered. The Veterinary Council sets standards for all undergraduate education programmes and works to ensure veterinary education and training remains up to date and is benchmarked to the highest international standards. The Veterinary Council also require that all veterinary practitioners and veterinary nurses fulfil ongoing professional education requirements to ensure they keep their knowledge and skills up to date throughout their professional lives. The Veterinary Council provide guidance to veterinary registrants on matters relating to conduct and ethics through their Code of Professional Conduct. The Code of Professional Conduct consists of the rules and principles which govern veterinary practitioners and veterinary nurses in the exercise of their profession. The Veterinary Council is also the designated body to which members of the public may make a complaint against a veterinary practitioner or veterinary nurse. One of the functions of the Council is to take disciplinary action in cases of professional misconduct. In 2018, the Veterinary Council held five fitness to practice inquiries following consideration of 21 complaints. As the Committee will be aware, the topic of corporate ownership of veterinary practices is a very divisive one and has been the subject of much debate in recent times. Since January 2018, there has been significant ongoing work in the Veterinary Council to progress consideration of the regulation of the practice in regards to corporate ownership. This is a very divisive and challenging matter for the profession. Nevertheless, the Veterinary Council must continue to ensure the highest standards of veterinary medicine in the regulation and management of the professions. Historically, 
Section 54.2 of the Veterinary Practitioners Act 2005 was interpreted to prevent a body corporate from owning a veterinary practice, and this understanding was reflected in the Code of Professional Conduct published by the Veterinary Council. <coughs> However, legal advice received by the Veterinary Council advised that the legislation does not speak to the ownership of practices, and thus the Council has no legal authority in determining the ownership of practice. The Veterinary Council has no legal powers over the regulation of the market in relation to corporate ownership of veterinary practice. The parameters of our powers as established under the Veterinary Practitioners Act 2005 simply do not extend to this area. In light of this, in December 2017, the Veterinary Council amended the Code of Professional Conduct to explicitly state that corporate ownership of veterinary practices was not prohibited. Following reaction from the veterinary professions and farming bodies, citing a lack of consultation on the matter of corporate ownership. The Veterinary Council, at a meeting in January 2018, decided to put the proposed amended section of the Code of Professional Conduct on hold and carry out an extensive consultation process of stakeholders on the subject of ownership of veterinary practice. Consultations conducted to date include a survey of the general public conducted by market research company Behaviour and Attitudes, a consultation process whereby any interested parties could submit their views, a survey of the veterinary professions conducted by market research company Behaviour and Attitudes, research and analysis on other veterinary regulators internationally, and research and analysis on other regulated professions in Ireland. The Veterinary Council has also benefited from legal advice on the matter. And all of these inputs, together with the results of the consultation process and survey of the public, are to be consolidated into a report by Grant Thornton. It is hoped this report will be available shortly for consideration by the Veterinary Council. In conclusion, the Veterinary Council is the statutory body responsible for the regulation and management of the veterinary professions. It is worth noting that as an independent regulator to the veterinary professions, there is no express legislative role for the Veterinary Council to determine the ownership of veterinary practices. The Veterinary Council is also about to embark on the development of a new corporate strategy for the five-year period of 2019 to 2023. The Council will look to work with partner bodies to shape the professional lives of veterinary registrants to ensure that the development and oversight of the veterinary professions continue to foster best professional practice in the best interests of animal welfare and public interest. We will continue to work to ensure that the high standards expected in the veterinary industry are upheld and that quality of veterinary care is continuously improving into the future. Finally, I would like to thank the Chair and the Committee for the invitation to address you today. Both the President of the Council, uh, Mr O'Scannell, and I are happy to address any questions that the Committee may have. Thank you very much, Ms Mildewan. Now we'll take questions from the members. The first thing to Kate were, was um, uh, Deputy Kenny, then Senator Clamour Walsh, then uh, Deputy Corkin Kennedy, in that order. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank both of you for coming in today to, to enlighten us on this situation. Um, I, I suppose maybe to, to, to put a little bit of context into this, we, we have um, received correspondence and, and some lobbying from, from various organisations and individuals as well around the issue of corporate ownership. And really, if, if you like to, to put a context into it, people fear that it will become like a boots situation in pharmacy or like a fast food chain type situation where you'd have a whole lot of veterinary practice around the country owned by a company who would have primarily profit and probably just concentrating on the aspects of veterinary practice which is the most profitable and leaving the others. And certainly from, from our perspective in, in, in an agriculture committee and looking after the, the interests of farmers and the primary producer, we're talking about the larger animals, the cow calf and the sheep out at night that needs, needs assistance and a vet can't be got. And in many areas of rural land there's already a problem with that. And certainly if we went down the route that is feared with, with the, the, the corporate uh, creeping into the situation, uh, there would be great fears for many people in the farming community that would happen. So um, I, I'd like to get, I suppose, a few questions around that first of all. Uh, the, the, the situation that you outlined in your, in your opening statement, um, you say that, that first of all, uh, that one of the, your, your key things is that you are to ensure that um, the duties are performed in accordance with the scribes, codes of professional conduct and ethics. In the context of uh, vets who are employees of a company which is not, which is not the vet, uh, I'd like to get detail as to how you, would, how you expect to be able to uh, 
make sure that that happens, make sure that, you, that, that the, the, the control is there and how you would find that. Uh, in regard to the, 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 the background, you say historically that Section 54.2 was considered to interpret as, as um, to prevent corporate bodies from only getting a practice. However, legal advice told you otherwise. When was that advice? And at what stage was that advice received? Um, because later on you, you stated that um, you went into the consultation process and also you said that the Veterinary Council has benefited from legal advice on the matter. I assume that is separate legal advice since then? And uh, can we get the details of that legal advice as to what the situation is in regard to that? Also, in, 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 a, in a general way, in regard to the um, practices that have already been bought out by companies, and, and I understand that some companies from Britain have come here and bought practices, uh, how many of them have they bought? Uh, are they, are, is, is that, that uh, vision of, of, of chains of practices starting to develop? Are they focusing on a particular type of practice? My understanding is they're focusing on the small animals, maybe equine practices, and that they're not as interested in the, the other practices that would be more general for the, the, the farmer community out there. And the fear people have, in, in fairness, is that if that's going to be the focus, and if, if a veterinary practice out there, we'll say a partnership out there, sell off a portion of their practice to a company, that they're selling off the portion of it that is most profitable and that the other part of it that isn't so profitable will end up going into decline. And that we'll see a situation where the farming community out there who need a service, who deserve a service, and who it's part of, of, of your job to ensure that that service is provided, that that will slip and, and not happen. Um, also, in regard to the, 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 the issue of, of partnerships versus limited companies, my understanding is that many veterinary practices have become limited companies years ago. For the last 20 years, many of them are limited companies. And that there's nothing in, in, in that respect wrong with that. And that has gone on. And yet, you're saying that your, your, your Article 54.2 prevented it from happening, or was interpreted to prevent it from happening. So I, I just don't get the, the if, if up until recently you thought there couldn't be companies, why were there ones? <laughs> that's that's a, a simple question. Um, also in regard to the, the uh, I, I think nobody has a problem with a vet or a number of vets setting up a limited company. But as I say, the issue is, and, and let's be clear about it, is that if uh, uh, a company of um, perhaps a group of investors came together and set up a company and decided to buy a couple of veterinary practices and expand that and expand that, that they don't have any skin in the game from the point of view that they have no concern for anything other than for the profit at the end of the day. And that there, is, there is concerns around that. Um, I also have concerns, and it's slightly off this, but it's, it's, it's also associated with it, is that talking to people around the country, they're telling me it's very hard to get uh, vets that are interested in doing the work with the farming community, that that's one of the big issues, that a lot of the vets that are qualifying are actually qualifying and are only interested in small animal practice and aren't interested in perhaps the, the, the tougher side of it and the least profitable side of it. And what, what element is, is, or what can be done to ensure that? Also in regard to the, the, the number of vets that are qualifying in Ireland, my understanding is, and you know, I, I have teenagers that are going to college at the moment and all that, and they're friends, and I, I sort of hear what's going on. And I, I know one particular um, young chap not that far from me that whole heart was set in being a vet, but he, he was 25 pounds short in his leaving cert, and there was no hope. And his family were not wealthy enough to send him to Budapest to train. And that, that's, that's a problem, you know, that I think needs to be addressed. Because I think in many other countries, and I, I think there may be an element of it here, where other disciplines can go ahead to train in veterinary college, but there's, it's very, very limited scope in Ireland for that to happen. And can that be opened up a little bit more? Because uh, certainly from our agricultural colleges, there are many who go through those courses who would have a keen interest and would, be, would pro probably make excellent vets, particularly because they come very much from an agricultural background. And, and, and they find that that's closed off to them because the way the system is at the moment. I'd like to get your views on that. Um, the, the, the issue in regard to the, the case, and, and it, was, it was, you pointed out that, that uh, you know, there was a change made. And, and my understanding is that were, were some of the people on the board, was there a conflict of interest there? Or were conflict of interest ever declared? That they were actually in the process of selling their own practices to corporates at the time that they were... Uh, work in regard to that. So I'll uh, leave it at that, Chairman. Thanks, uh, Deputy. Uh, Senator Connell, question, please. 
and thank you for your opening statement. Um, the major problem, as I see it, is the shortage of um, vets, large animal vets, in rural areas, and particularly on the peripheral areas. So my direct question is, what are you, as the Veterinary Council, doing to, to address that in the immediate, medium and long-term future um, in relation to that? You see, in terms of the entity, the legal entity of a veterinary practice, it, it, isn't, it isn't an issue for us in the sense it's the availability. And it's what you're doing in terms of education. So how much communication do you have with UCD and the education providers here to ensure that um, there are sufficient number of large animal uh, vets available? So my other question would be, for the, the, the large animals that we have in the state, for instance, how many um, vets do we need? And do you map them on a geographical basis to make sure there's a proper um, geographical uh, spread on it? And what are you doing in terms of the qualifications, the number of uh, points required and the pathways to qualifications? And have you come across the issues where um, Susie Grantaid, for instance, is, um, is allotted to vets who are, who are training abroad, but they, then it comes to them doing their final year, doing their masters, where they then cannot get, uh, get funding uh, for those. And why do you think it is that there are so many vets, um, large animal vets, uh, leaving the, the practices? Um, so they're my, they're my main questions. I just want to get out of today what you're doing as a veterinary council to be able to address that, because I feel that we're, we're, we're going down a route. Um, it's almost like the, the lack of priests in, in some of the areas now, and we need to do really uh, tangible things. Some might say that bets were a lot more important than that, <laughs> but I won't get into that argument. But, um, <laughs> that, um, but, you know, we need to address it, and we need to address it in a way that areas like I come from, like uh, Balmullet and areas and areas of Mayo, that we know. Farmers need to know, you see, going in, and because of the additional requirements that are made on herds now and, and, and all of that, they need to know that there's going to be an affordable uh, and available vet there to meet their needs for them to continue on farming uh, in the way that they need to. So, Gormag, here. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Deputy Corp and Kenya, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming in here this afternoon. Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions which are quite similar to the previous two. I'm just looking at um, Section 54.2 of the Veterinary Practices Act and uh, you, it was in being interpreted at the time that it would prevent a body corporate from owning a veterinary practice. And uh, I was just wondering uh, why it was reviewed uh, to, and that review then led to the revision of the, um, the Code of Professional Conduct. Um, and you know, what, why, why um, was that legal advice sought and when was it? And you're saying that uh, you have no legal powers over the regulation of the market. Can I ask, is it something that you would uh, be seeking further powers to actually um, extend into that particular area? And I wanted to raise the question around the, um, what seems to be a lot of the uh, students that are uh, graduating, that a lot of them are going into the smaller animal practices. And uh, if you have re reviewed the situation and uh, had a look at the numbers of graduates who are actually going into the large animal practices, say, for example, over the last five years, um, if you'd have any idea of how many of the total graduates across the country are actually going into the large animal practices. And I see also that you're developing a new strategy for 2019 to 2023. And I'm wondering, will that uh, stakeholders consultation that you are, have, uh, have conducted, will that form part of the, um, the review in terms of uh, the ownership as well? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Deputy. Uh, Deputy Cahill. Thank you, Chairman, and, and thanks for the, pre the presentation. 
I suppose um, while we have concerns about rural areas and the provision of services to, I suppose, to, 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 to rural Ireland in the future for large animal practices, I think the, the principal point that we want to discuss today was the, co was the corporate ownership of practices and whether that was, whether, I suppose, one thing is whether it is a good thing for the industry, but the second thing is whether, whether, whether it was legally, legally correct to do it. And I just, I find just parts of the presentation contradictory. You see here, the Council has no legal powers over the regulation of the market in relation to corporate ownership of veterinary practices. The parameters of our powers established under the Veterinary Practice Act 2005 simply do not extend to this area, which is a fairly clear and, 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 and concise statement, and you made this on the basis of getting, uh, of getting legal advice. But two paragraphs down, then the month after, you decided to suspend um, the decision you had made in, in, in December because of views coming from, from, um, from different stakeholders. And you have five bullet, six, five bullet points then of research you were going to do in regard to the decision you made in December. But like, you clearly say that the decision you made in December was clear-cut and that the legal advice said that there was no ambiguity. And still then, a month later, um, we're, we're following reaction from vets and farming bodies, you suspend um, the decision you made in December, even though you said that you know, your legal advice was absolutely clear. So I just... I, I find this, you know, very contradictory, and like we are in a state of flux at the moment, where uh, you, you're, you're doing a, a review to know whether this is uh, whether this um, is is correct to do, and you're going to grant grant or are going to publish a report, but still practices are being are being um, purchased by by corporates while the, while the review is going on. And first thing I think, you know. I'd have, I'd have expected that there would have been a handbrake put on all on all sales while you were, you know, do, doing the review. But it it seems to me that somewhere between December and January, a lack of confidence came came into the veterinary council as regards the legal advice that was received, because um, you know um, it seems that you know when you when, when, after getting legal advice and making a decision, and then you you go on, you, you, uh, you go through a consultation process. Uh, to me, um, there's the, the train of events here um, doesn't make sense to me. Um, surely the consultation process should have took place before a decision was made by the Veterinary Council to allow corporates to purchase practices. And, and it has been said you know, already here by Deputy Kenny that you know, had anyone a conflict of interest that was in the making of the decision of the Veterinary Council, and I suppose you know, a purchase of, of, of one very well-known practice has attracted a lot of media attention, and there is a lot of uh, questions being asked as to whether there was a conflict of interest there. But it, I would just like the, the sequence of events to be explained. I can't, like, you know, that, that paragraph there on, on page two of your presentation is, is very unambiguous and very clear, but ne the next two or three paragraphs, in my view, completely contradict it. And um, the, the Veterinary Council, by going into a consultation process, have really put question marks over the legal advice they, they received, and they took a very um, uh, profound, they took a very serious decision on that legal advice in December, and in my view, then set back from it in January 18. And just, you know, as I'm not a barrister, and you know, there's more more legal-minded people on this table than me, but. You know, the Veterinary Council cites as one of their disciplinary actions in the case of professional misconduct. And, you know, how does this work in practice if a veterinary practice isn't owned by a vet? Uh, you know, how do the disciplinary, how do the disciplinary um, uh, procedure work? And obviously, you know, you can take it against the individual vet, but if, if the practice, if, you know, you're not taking against uh, the, the veterinary, the ownership of the veterinary practice, you know, how does that sit? Would, how does the powers of veterinary council sit with taking disciplinary action when, when, when the ownership rests outside, rests outside a, 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 veterinary, a veterinary practitioner? But you know, I'm not, I'm not at all happy with the sequence of events here. Um, something in it doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't sit with, right with me at all. Uh, you know, the veterinary advice, and I, I said I would like to see a copy of the veterinary advice, but 
You know, you get any two good barristers and, 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 and give, ask them a question, and you can get two, two very, very different legal advices. But um, I have concerns here. First of all, I don't think, in, in my own view, you know, um, corporates coming in here and acquiring practices, um, I can't see it providing any better service on the ground, and I would have serious concerns about it, even from a service point of view. But um, from the whole disciplinary role that Veterinary Ireland have, or the Veterinary Council of Ireland have, I think it raises question marks too. But um, I think the interpretation of this, this all hinges on the interpretation of, of this uh, Veterinary Petitions Act 2005. And um, I, I repeat myself now, but to go into consultation after making a decision is definitely, in my view, does the, 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 you're not confident on the uh, you're not confident on the decision you took in, in December 17, and um, I think um, you know I think at the very least at the moment um, say, um, sales of practices should be halted until this whole situation is clarified once and for all, and um, um, a Grant Thornton report after taking this decision. It's the sequence of events um, baffles me. So I would like explanations on, on, on that. Please, Thanks, Deputy. A couple more members indicate. I'll take them maybe first of all. Deputy Penrose first, then yeah. Senator Daly. Thanks for the, coming in here. Um, I had a, looked carefully at the Veterinary Practice Act 2005, and I mean the establishment and its job to regulate the practice of veterinary medicine and in the interest of the public. And that's very important. And to promote the practice of veterinary medicine. And I've looked at Section 13. In relation to the Code of Professional Product, I also looked at Section 26, dealing with disclosure of interest by members of a veterinary council or any committee attached there too. Now, one understands that changes, you know, to the Veterinary Practice Act may well be warranted over time. Not nothing stands still, but surely that should only take place, if at all, after proper and full and comprehensive consultation with all stakeholders. Now, some of the stuff you, uh, you, you outlined to us here today is actually utterly unbelievable. Because, you know, you're saying, you're saying you made changes. And then the peculiar thing about making a change, you start the process after making the change, instead of carrying out the consultation in advance of making the change. I mean, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's, 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 it's enormous for a very reputable body. And I am very concerned about, about uh, some of the things my colleagues have stated in relation to the large farm practices and, and large animal practices, because, I mean, I'm worried about the way things are going. Because I come from a very small village where we're very lucky to have a <coughs> guy, uh, Charlie Murta, who there for the last 40 years. Not. But when he retires, where do we go? And, you, and, it, and it has become a It was a leahist in 1974 when I was a young college guy, I gone in. Um, I always enjoyed playing for the Ags against the Vets, uh, <laughs> um, because it was good, tough stuff, good rural people, one against the other. There was no whinging. But um, what, I do, what I do recall is, I mean, I always felt it was kind of a You had to have about 40 points more to become a vet than to, become a, than to do agriculture. In actual, in actual fact, agriculture is a wider discipline. Far wider, and I'm very proud of that. But anyway, uh, it allowed me to go into something else, so that'll just tell you how wide it is. But um, um, in, in, that, in, in that event, in that event, I mean, look, just want to, the very best of young, there's the very best of young people out there who make great vets. If they, if they, if they cut out, you know, I mean, this thing of points. If a person could have 600 points, but they might know nothing about animals. A person with 250 points might be the greatest person that an animal ever was. Detect everything. Could detect red water just looking out, out, out of the field a half a mile away. So that's, those, those, are, those are the things that, that annoys me about that. But that's not your, that's not your concern. But I think you should, you, it's something you should follow up because you just want to get the best people into, the, into your practice and I acknowledge that. But I have to go through this very carefully with you because, um, you know, I don't know who gave you the section. I mean, uh, I better clear I'm a barrister now, so. Section 54, subsection 2, subsection A, B and C. There's a specific prohibition on the practice of veterinary medicine or surgery by corporate bodies, no matter what you say. And I know you can get advice, but I, that's, my, that's my opinion. A body corporate can employ or engage a registered vet, all right, to practice veterinary medicine. But, of course, they have to be bound by the Code of Ethics and Code of Conduct from yourselves. 
So I think what you did in December 2017 represented a significant change and departure in relation to you know people being engaged or employed. Um, and it was engaged, it was embarked unilaterally by yourselves, with little or no input from anybody else. And more specifically, the Oroctus here, whose job it is to deal with legislative amendments. You took a primary act, and he's decided you have, you have, you have set up under Section 13 to do your own job, but you decided to, 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 to interpret this again, because you said that you have been bound by Section 54, Subsection 2 for ages. A particular interpretation. So they, I, I agree with your original, uh, whoever advised you originally did, did so correctly. And remember this, you don't have untrammeled or <coughs> uninhibited powers to do what you like and disregard the legislative framework, which I feel you have done. You know, and it introduced at a full swoop a, a system of deregulation, which is prohibited expressly. And in case you don't, I mean, and I know Ms Muldoon is a solicitor, she knows this better than I do, but she wasn't there in fairness to her, I want to say that straight up. Shall is, is mandatory, may is discretionary, and shall allows no, doesn't brook any other chain, uh, interpretation. So that is, I can't understand, and we were, we were sending signals about this, but you weren't here, you didn't have no interest in us. The minister, as I understand it now, so you, you, you went to him and you tried to seek some advice from him, or him I think at the time, which meant that you were kind of concerned as well. And yet you just didn't wait, or you were impatient. For some good reason you were impatient. And we have to find out why that impatience grew into a, a very unusual unilateral decision, which effectively deregulates the system. So I, 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 I am cert certainly somewhat uh, taken aback by, by, the, by the fact that you made a decision today, in December, and a few weeks later in January, after eating the Christmas dinner, you to say that it was unsafe. It wasn't. It, 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 Mr. Deputy Cal is correct. It, something, something triggered something in somebody to say, stall the horse. But the horse was already out of the whole stable and galloping away. And lo and behold, you know, I mean, we have been, we have been rooting around here at this. There have been lots of concerns, actually, at your own meetings in March 2017. You have a legislative and ethics committee. I'm sure you have that there, as everybody has. I have it in my own bars of perfection, and everybody else has it. So, you saw, there was lots of concerns being expressed before he's made a decision. So how did those concerns, which were wiped away like the snows of the winter, then re-emerge following the decision? But that didn't stop because in ja after January 2018, after you was going and saying, look, God, we better consult everybody, which is a very good thing. And then you this is going to be distilled altogether in a grand tort and report out here whenever the sun rises again. That will be the position then. But that didn't stop a body corporate getting involved in June or July 2018, six or seven months after. So surely if you had second thoughts in January 2018, why was anybody allowed to proceed to go ahead and purchase a practice corporation in Six months later, that doesn't make sense. I'd like to have a body like that where I could uh, give an opinion today and uh, write an opinion tomorrow for the very same, for a different crowd who's in opposition to the crowd that I was against. That's the type of, that's the analogy that's there. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely stone flummoxed about this. I can't, I can't, maybe I'm, I'm probably a bit dull, but um, so, the question has to be, why didn't this, I just call it, review an extensive consultation process of stakeholders on the subject of veterinary practices, why didn't that take place and inform the process and that in, while you were doing that, that the status quo 
and Miss Muldoon will know the words I'm going to use now. Status quo, antebellum, prevail. Status quo, the one before the decision, before any war happens. That's the, that's the point. That should have prevailed. And that will be maintained pending the outcome of the review. Now, that's, the, that's what it is. Now, we have been on about this, Chairperson, for the last 18, 18 months, certainly. To go to 18 months. Since, I just come up in December 2017 and come up in the Irish Farmers Journal. I recall it very well. Christmas, I remember it well. So this is going on. And what I, you know, and what I see all happen, this is why I come from a very rural back, back in the sticks, as I say. And there'll be no one. Do you think corporations like that would worry about us out miles from Mullingar at loan? <laughs> we'll be lost. But, so, and then in June 2018, a corporate body purchases a veterinary practice and then proceeds to own and operate that. What I, what I saw happen was that, you know, the question has to be, the kernel of this is, in my view, and you'll have to answer this, or we'll have to find out why you won't answer it, was the section of, on, on the ownership of the veterinary practices was under review, which have stayed been black and white here to us today, why have ye allowed non-vets to purchase and own and operate a veterinary practice? When you are. And do you think, in, let's, let's ask a basic question, do you think that non-vets should be allowed to own and operate veterinary practices? Because there was a case, in, 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 in an EU case there back in, a German case, taken back in 2009, and it was about pharmacies. But the very same situation, a parallel situ situation arose. And because of the is issues in the protection of health and welfare and everything else, that was out outlawed. Somebody says, oh, this is against the freedom of establishment, freedom of movement, and all of that. The EECJ says, no, a state, a state can put in place the particular um, rules that can operate. Um, Deputy Deputy Cattle and them have asked, I mean, the legal advice you had in 2017 that allowed you to change, uh, you know, the codes, specific elements of the Code of Conduct. Um, you know, you've got that, you, you've said you've got that. But after having got that and implemented a change, why then did you then say, well, you doubt it, because by doing what you did in January 2018, you doubted the change. And you, you had second thoughts about the voice that allowed you to change. And my own view of it is, for what it's worth, to both of you there today, in good faith, you have no right to change anything. In my view, under the Veterinary Practice Act, it's an amendment made to the Veterinary Practice Act. That's, that's the way to proceed. And the Minister... Uh, sh should, should be taking a hand in this uh, because I, I'm not saying there's use, use are entitled to argue for changes in the Act. You are, of course. Time goes on. That's Act is 14 years of age, 15 years going on, 15 years of age. I was here when it was passed uh, and I, I, know, I know a small bit about it. But that's, that's why you, you, I'm not saying you don't, you don't have rights to, to do that. But I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed by the whole, by the whole thing um, in, in, in relation to how, in the space of a, less than a month, the whole thing show, turned upside down. Now, you, you say, I think Ms Muldoon outlines in, in her, and I think, she, as far as I read earlier on there, I think you only come into operation or into your position, and I wish you well in it, uh, in, in, in May, April there. So you, you're new. So, in fairness, you were trying to answer, but I'm sure Mr Scanlon was there, maybe, so he may answer. Um, for, for some of this, uh, but, uh, you know, I, and, and um, how will you, if people, if you allow a corporation to own a veterinary practice, how do you regulate that, the operation then? How do you do it? Because that's important. And... Was 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 not very important to, to you know the original 
The original guideline was to own and operate. And then your recommendation come along and says own. And that's significant. The conjunctive was taken over and just left with, with, with its own on its, on its own. So I, 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 can, um, I can see that, that that's, uh, you know, you, you, you've left yourself somewhat open to, to, to a charge that that's, you've changed your mind in the space of three, three to four weeks at most. Uh, and it's, it's unbelievable. You, you're entitled to change your mind because you can go back to your committee and say, look, we've had another thought about the legal advice uh, our committee is, or we've we got further advice. You might go to some of the big boys and, 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 and get their advice. You might have got advice from me and you say, oh yeah, we'll take that. Then you say, gee, because no, we, we, we've got somebody who's in the competition area or in whatever area and get advice from them. Mm -hmm. That's grand. But the problem at that stage is you should have stalled the process and reverted back to what your code of conduct that was, was, was applying at that time. And then there wouldn't be a question. You'd still be waiting for Grant Thornton to distill the, the, the various findings that you're going to uh, emanate from your investigation. And that's grand. Your consultation process is prolonged. That's grand. Um, you said you, you're expecting it, I think, in June or, is it, or July, whatever it is. Maybe you would give us a, 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 an idea of when this consultation process is, is, is will end and when. When, will, when can you be expected to issue, I suppose, the reviewed position on ownership uh, and operation, I hope, of veterinary practices? I think they would, they would be very important in that regard. But there's a number of questions I would like, well, my, my, not just me, but my colleagues have raised a number of very interesting questions, very salient points, and I hope that we get some answers. Thanks, Deputy. We'll take those questions, of course, we have senators who are voting and they'll be back in, in due course. So we'll take those questions first of all. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will deal with some of the questions and then I will ask my colleague, Pather, to come in on some other matters. So firstly, uh, Deputy Kenny, uh, thank you for your questions. Um, the Veterinary Council has no role in ownership. It has never had a role in ownership and it will not have a role in ownership into the future. It is a statutory body and it oversees the quality of services delivered by its registrants. So you talk about um, profit focus. The Veterinary Council will be very strong in its role in ensuring that the integrity and the quality of the provision of veterinary medicine and their services will always remain of the highest of standards. Um, you also uh, query the time of legal advice. The Veterinary Council as a body corporate received advices uh, in both 2017 and 2018. Um, the Veterinary Council is a very informed and engaged body. It is very aware of the importance and the significance of the role that it carries and it takes no decisions lightly. Um, in terms of programmes of education, you're correct in that there is one programme of undergraduate education in Ireland at the moment. The Veterinary Council is the body that accredits uh, programmes of education. It is not within the gift or the control of the Council um, to, uh, to, to initiate new programmes. The Council is the body that accredits uh, programmes of education. So I suppose that's outside of the, um, of the gift of the Council to to seek to increase the number of registrants. I can say that there are very good uh, communications with um, UCD um, in terms of the programme of education that's delivered and I think all members would acknowledge uh, the standard of graduates produced uh, in Ireland in the field of veterinary medicine. You also refer to uh, conflict of interest of board members and I am happy to confirm that the Veterinary Council takes all its decisions as a body corporate. So no one individual member um, you know, carries, uh, carries particular interests. All members around that table, and there is a mix of profile around that table, elected, appointed, and public interest reps, all wear public interest hats when sitting at, uh, at that council table. Senator Conroy Walsh um, talks about uh, the geographical spread of, of uh, veterinary surgeons and nurses and the pathways to qualifications. I don't want to repeat myself, but like I say, there is one programme of education accredited by the Veterinary Council, and that is delivered by uh, University College Dublin. 
the Council, uh, as referenced in the opening statement, is about to embark on the development of its corporate strategy. So, uh, in terms of pathways to qualifications, um, geographical spreads of vets um, and veterinary nurses, and all of the data available to the Veterinary Council may well be an aspect that is uh, covered in the strategy going forward in terms of the role of the Veterinary Council influencing policy of the Department and otherwise into the future. But like I say, that is a matter for the strategy, which is yet to be, um, yet to be commenced, and ultimately that strategy will be determined by the Veterinary Council. Deputy Corcoran Kennedy um, asks uh, whether the Council will seek further powers uh, to extend its remit into the future. It would be wrong for me to, um, to predict how the Council will, um, you know, will act into the future. As I say, the strategy will uh, be developed later this year. The Council is precluded currently in relation to ownership, um, but would, what I can say is that the Council will use all of its regulatory tools um, at its disposal to ensure the continued high standards in the practice of veterinary medicine. The period of consultation um, embarked upon by the Council over the last number of months has illuminated a number of aspects uh, for Council to consider in its strategy and into the future, so it has been very beneficial in that sense. Um, and Deputy Cahill, you... So why was the legal advice sought? Um, legal advice was sought on the basis that it was believed that there were some inconsistencies in the Code of Conduct. The Code of Conduct has been in its current form for a very long number of years, um, and so before any changes, any significant changes were made, legal advice was sought, as any regulatory body would do, um, you know, before, before embarking on any such changes. There were deemed to be inconsistencies in the Code, and it was on that basis that advices were sought. Um, a query in relation to the decisions taken by the Council. As I say, the Veterinary Council is a body corporate and all decisions made uh, are, by the, are by the Council as, a, as an entire unit. I can't answer you that offhand. Uh, as I say, it might be a case that uh, research and analysis will be carried out by the Veterinary Council over the coming years, but I don't have, I don't have that data or that information to hand. Um, I will... Come to, I suppose briefly before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Father um, Deputy Penrose, you correctly state that the um, Veterinary Council acts in the public interest and in the best interests of animal health and welfare. Um, you refer to a deregulation of the system, and I would like us all to be very clear that the Veterinary Council regulates the practice of veterinary medicine. The Veterinary Council, you know, oversees the, um, the practice of veterinary medicine by its registrants, by the individuals on their roles. Um, and the Veterinary Council at no time will allow for any uh, diminution in standards uh, and will always safeguard the, um, the very important integrity of clinical discretion of its registrants in the best interests of the public and animal health and welfare. I might ask my colleague, uh, Pader, the President, to, um, to comment. I'm very pleased to be here and, and to answer as many of these questions as I possibly can, and they are quite pointed and they are quite relevant. Um, just as a very background, I'm, I'm veterinary through my bones and whatever on both sides, and my dad was a vet, my uncle was a vet on my mum's side, uncle was a vet on dad's side, cousins vets. I have a daughter studying veterinary, uh, and she's studying it in Budapest abroad, so that was mentioned, and I'll come to that in a mo. Uh, veterinary medicine, large animal services is what it is. I would have been reared with my grandmother and great grandmother, were dairy farmers in the main street of Swords, believe it or not, and there were cows being milked in Swords, and my brother continues to milk cows in Swords. He's a, a, a a substantial herd in the Swords area. Uh, he appears on the bottle. I don't know if you see the bottle of milk, but uh, as But the family, in fairness, there was 11 of us, and there's two of us uh, vets. So it's, it's in our bones from start to finish. It, it, this, the profession will be very important to us. Uh, Deputy uh, Kennedy, if I can, just before I start to answer your questions, uh, on a background issue, really, this came up in Council for, for quite a few years. I'm currently its president, I'm proud to be, but I'm eight years, this will be my eighth year on Council. So about three or four years ago, or a good while ago, questions were being asked who could and who couldn't buy a practice, and who could a, could a corporate be involved in it. It was quite clear to us, no, you couldn't have a corporate involved in it. And the question was always around about ownership, and could you not? And then when we were looking at the code, there was issues in the code that were almost contradictory, because there's no doubt there are vets that work for corporates 
well, could a corporate therefore not? And it was always the case of ownership. So really what the Veterinary Council had to do was look at the Act, and it really is now, and I do take completely, there's no question about it, had this been done beforehand, far better we would be for it, far better. But in fairness, by the time you know, we, we got our reaction from the stakeholders, we realised we needed to go much wider than this. But in the Act, as our Registrar has said, there's no mention at all of ownership. In fact, the practice is not mentioned at all. The, an actual practice as an entity is not mentioned. But what is very clear in the Act, and this is just as background before I answer the questions, what is very clear is the description of what is the practice of veterinary medicine, as in anything to do with health, disease, anything to do with an animal, any advice thereof, any treatment thereof, any surgery, certification. It goes on then to, to mention post-mortem examination and rectal examinations of mares per, 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 per rectum. It's laid out there that anything to do with the animals, it then is very clear in section 54 who it is can and cannot do that for a ward or otherwise. And that is very much, if it's veterinary medicine, veterinary practitioners only. If it's veterinary nursing, obviously veterinary nursing. And that's in the Act also. So it's very clear who can provide that and who provides that service to a third party for a ward or otherwise. So that's where our focus is. And when we were being asked a question about who can buy and sell a practice, we've never really, and going right back in the day ever, if a practitioner were to retire but he continued to own the practice or a practitioner spouse owned half the practice or whatever way those things, we were never, the council was never involved in it. But we were asked these questions, we did have inconsistencies within our code and it was felt clarification was needed. The statement that there's no prohibition against ownership, well in fairness, as a standalone, the problem is the consequence of such a statement. But as a standalone statement, actually a practice is not mentioned in the Act, and the ownership of it is not mentioned in the Act. So as a statement, but the problem with these statements on the standard, they have knock-on effects. And operation, which was picked up on by the Deputy Penrose, is the operation of the practice. People weren't really talking about ownership. They were using the word OWN, but they were actually trying to become operators of. And in fairness, the Act is quite clear. The description of veterinary practice. Who it is can and can't do it, for reward otherwise, to animal owners, or if you're working in industry, to your industry employer, or if you're working for education, to your education employer. So if I can answer your questions then, uh, as we go, is there a boot situation going to go c come forward? Or wh what, are we, what are we going to see, and how can we control such a thing? Heretofore, we never, we never were. Uh, interested in the ownership. We're interested in the vets and the vets only. That is where our regulation is. And it's the veterinary regulation of that service to the public will be where we will be. And the owner is actually a sideline. It's actually a distraction. And it has been very divisive, has been very distracting. But our concentration in the consultation is heading absolutely specifically on following what the Act is telling us, that only a veterinary practitioner can carry out what is described in 53 as veterinary, uh, the Act of Veterinary Medicine for a, uh, a third party um, for a ward or otherwise, and that's to the animal owner. And that's what we're primarily spoke, speaking about here, the farming community, <coughs> um, horse owners, animal owners in general. Uh, section 54, when did you get the legal advice? We did get various legal advices. There's some going back as, as far as 2014. There's even the Competition Authority goes back even further than that, where they mentioned it was vague even on their legal advice. But the legal advice that we were coming in with was, look at owners are not there. And the words, as I said, came in, and there's no doubt about it, consultation. We'll be first to put the hand up. Consultation was far, far better had that come beforehand. There's no question about that. The consultation is now going ahead, and during that consultation, there's a line through that. It's definitely under review. Everybody knows it's under review. So who's buying and who's selling? Practices have always, over the years and ever, been bought and sold, and the Veterinary Council has no hand actor part in any of that. There's no remit in who's buying or who's selling them. They would be passed down, usually, from generation to generation. But very often, as I said, they would be in, in the hands of others, or they might be part owners or investors. The one thing is that the owners and the investors don't influence in any way the decision of how many blood tests or how many services you do or how many x-rays you do, um, that is in the hands. The autonomy of service, the clinical autonomy, must at all times be in the hands of the vets. And that's what we're talking about, uh, where we're heading with all of this. Section 54, when did you get your legal advice? As I said, we got various ones, and there's no doubt the most recent ones of all are reiterating ownership and who can buy and sell really isn't ours. 
How many of these bought at this time? Because we've never known who actually owned practices, we genuinely have never known who ever owned a practice, and the Act doesn't describe a practice, we've never actually, we've no handle on it, we, we don't ask anyone who actually owns your practice, it's who's controlling it and who's running it, which Deputy Penrose has mentioned, and I will come to him, how come or why did that suddenly disappear? Um, it, that is the important one, and that's where our remit comes in. Do you, do you, not, do you not see that the, the ownership and the control are important, that if the, if the ownership is, is out of the control, is away from, from any uh, focus that you've got, if you're saying you don't care who owns it, it doesn't matter if, if, if Donald Trump wants to come and buy veterinary practice now, that's fine, well then people have a problem because they feel that the, the ethics and the code of ethics may not be followed as, restric as strictly as they would normally be if the practice was owned by vets who have trained and who have a, a complete knowledge of the industry. That's, that's where we're coming to. And I think, you know, to say that you don't care who owns it, I think seems to me to be sidestepping uh, the issue here. Like, you have a responsibility. And surely your responsibility is to make sure that everything is done correctly. And if you just say we don't care who owns it, as long as it's done correctly. For instance, if we have a practice and there's a number of vets working in it, and those vets are uh, controlled by the, by the practice for to only use particular medicines, so we had discussion here earlier on about closed loops within the farming industry, about, about the beef production. You know, if you have a similar situation in a veterinary practice, how, how well is that going to work long term? That's, that's the issues that we've got. And, and I think, you know, to say that you don't care who owns it is, is, is slightly stepping outside of, 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 of where you need to be. I mean, if you are going to be in control, then you have to care who owns it. Well, I, I must apologise. If, if I did use the word that I don't care, what I mean is that the Veterinary Council doesn't have remit over who actually owns it. It's Could not you? In the well, perhaps, let's see, but in fairness, when we're finished with our consultation, if we can, and we may have to come back into you once we have our considerations done, and we would love to, the opportunity to come back into you, uh, we, perhaps legislative change, but we have to work within the Act that we currently have. And we're hoping, not hoping, we are absolutely adamant that the, the practice of veterinary medicine, who is actually carrying out that practice of veterinary medicine, where can it be done? You need to have a certificate supplied by ourselves to an applicant who must be a registrant, who must be a vet, which is non-transferable and is for four years and four years only and we can add conditions to it and limitations on it. So the control of it is completely in the hands of the vet and as far as we're concerned the, regula the regulation of that practice is regulating the practitioners that are providing the service to the public. That is exactly our role, that's exactly where our focus is. Uh, the other is more a side, it's not that we don't care, but the other is a side issue. An owner cannot, if an owner wishes to influence uh, the, the veterinary practitioners and the veterinary practitioners have any concerns about it, it's to ourselves. We've issued a certificate to that premises at, from which, at and from which the service starts. So in fairness, if there's any concerns that the owner is doing anything because the autonomy of service and the questions that the vets have about what, how they tend to their animals or what drugs they use, what surgery they use, that is completely in the hands of the profession, completely in the hands of the professionals working in it. And there's no contract and there's no entrance of anything that they can do or enter into anything that lowers that or diminishes that in any way. Uh, that's really what it is. Not that, that we wouldn't care, it's that the Act doesn't empower us to do anything in relation to the specific actually who owns. What it does do is specifically who is providing the service and specifically that's practitioner only, and they're under our regulations. A, far a farmer in, in, in Drumkeeran in North Leitrim has the, brings up the calving bed is out. Yeah. Need a vet now. Yeah. But the company that owns it says, sorry, there's no vet working. Well, that's the company, and that's not... How do we... How do we like, the, the, pra the practice is, the reality is that a vet will come. Yeah. The vets get out there and do it. You know, and uh, many people, and we've complained about the health service, tell us that an awful lot of the veterinary practitioners are actually better than the health service in many places. Because they're a spy. They, they, they get out there in the middle of the night. And the difficulty people have is that we have a company in charge. That that company will say, well, I'm sorry, you're not going to be paid. Well, sorry, if, uh, that's what I that's, want to... That's the point, I think, yeah. that, that we need to get to. That's what I want to clarify. It is not the company that's providing the service. It is not a company that's providing the service. It is the vet and the vets that are together with their certificate of suitability at the premises that's identified on our register with the CPT points. They are the... the with their basic degree, they are, you know, and their continuing education afterwards. They are the only people providing that service. It is to them that the farmer is making contact, and it is to them that will answer, and they are obliged for that 24-hour cover 
the others are investors, and investors no more. They are not influencers, they are not the people answering the phone, and they are not the people providing the service. The service is provided by the vets. The ownership isn't within our remit, but it's the service provision very much is in within our, in, within our remit. Sorry. The practices that would be that would be carried out by veterinary practice, the owner would dictate what's done. Like if, if, a, if a corporate owner says, "Well, we're going to close on Sundays," he's the owner, and the vet is working for him. So surely you have to obey him. That, that, that's exactly where the, the codes come in. The veterinary practitioner can't act outside the code, and the act is very, very clear. It is not the corporate. The corporate, as Deputy Penrose has said, is completely excluded from providing the service. It is only the vet who can provide the service, 54.2c specifically says, and vets can't assist somebody else to provide a service. You cannot. The only person who can actually act veterinary medicine and the only person who can provide that service are the vets working in that practice. But as I said, a practice in itself is not, um, is not um, described in the Act. What is described is the certificate of suitability which is given to a vet and a vet only if it's veterinary medicine they're giving. And for, that's the premises. And the vets that are working on it are listed on that certificate of suitability. And that's the service to the farmer. They cannot enter a contract that affects them in any way that diminutes their answerability to the Veterinary Council of Ireland, to the code, and to their basic core principles of veterinary medicine. So it's not, as I said, that we don't care. We're acting with the registrants and the service that they are providing at and from the premises to which we've given them a certificate of suitability. The ownership issue is one that's dragging us into an area where we are not on solid footing because the Act does not mention ownership, nor even practice. So, so to talk about, oh, you know, somebody has bought, there have been and has been ever and always people involved in practices, there have been investors, but they cannot be influencers. The people actually running the show in control with their hands on the wheels are the vets. With, with respect, sorry, do you want to get in there? Sorry. We're in the sleep of the wheel. I mean, sure, you know, we, we, gave, we gave you an opportunity here to suggest and we're making contact with you, that, that, uh, that uh, if there was changes required to the Act. So as to clarify this, beyond year or nay, you know, I think some of the points you're making are accurate, but I do think some of the other points you're making are, are, are accurate, but, uh, because I, I still think that, uh, that there's a prohibition there. But now, uh, we'll go away from that for a minute and just ask, you know, surely if you allow somebody, anybody to own a veterinary practice, anybody, you ha by implication you have undermined your ability to regulate the operation of the veterinary practice in, 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 in Ireland. You have to. Because, I mean, anybody can have it. And the owner, the owner is, is, is in a very powerful position. And apart from altogether getting into the niceties of this ownership and all the operation and all like that, those... I mean, this is going to come into a, a supermarket job, or some of those big bodies, and rural Ireland is going to be left in the hind hit and wiped out. That's where, that's, that's where this is going. If you, if you don't come back in and speak to the Minister for Agriculture, you, know, you, have, you have a direct line to the Minister for Agriculture, and I'd like to know what representations did you make, or did you just go through the motions of the Veterinary Council meeting, sit down and, and go through and say, oh, God, we have an awful problem, this is not part of the, our poor view at all. Well, if it wasn't, you get back to the Minister. That's, that's what we're here for. There's opposition spokesperson here waiting to get an opportunity to bring forward acts or amendments to acts or whatever. And the government itself would take it aboard. They would. And to try and solve this problem. Because the government, obviously, of Ireland, they know bloody well this is going to have implications. And I, I'm surprised at a veterinary council. And you know, Mr. Scanlon, you, you, you have a long experience of it uh, in, in this regard. But there was. There was indecent haste about what happened. There was indecent haste. And when you have indecent haste, there has to be another lying motive. So what we want to get is, what was the motive to make the change in December and not await the outcome of a review, which has properly been carried out? I have no doubt about it. It's properly been carried out. Ms. Bladoon, you'll have a feather in your cap when this is carried out. But, you know... It's very hard to unscramble the egg. And that's the problem. It's very hard to unscramble the egg. I have to go away to vote, Senator Daly.
Uh, thanks, Chair, and apologies. We had to go away to vote. And just picking up on, on, on the tail end of Deputy Penrose's contribution, I think when you leave like this, you might end up going over all ground because you don't know what has been discussed while you were away. And, and they were the questions, uh, as I say, I pick up from the tail end of Deputy Penrose's response. Like, what I wanted to know for, from the Veterinary Council was what was the catalyst to, to start the procedures you started in the beginning of 2018? And why would you, in your role, seek personal or private legal advice when 54 to is law, as far as my reading of the game, and I wouldn't be as well qualified or, or, or versed in, in, in law as Deputy Penrose would. Why didn't it come to us here? We're the legislators in this land. The Minister has the ultimate responsibility. And what was the catalyst for you kind of turning a blind eye on the back of private personal legal advice, where we have an Attorney General, we have committees of agriculture, we have deputies and senators, and as Deputy Penrose says, opposition parties who are only too willing to have a go at a minister or department if they think there's something wrong or there's some flaw in legislation. Like, what was the catalyst for all them changes? And I think the question may have been asked, but as I say, I, I, I wasn't here. You've undermined your, 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 your primary role, in my opinion. It was mentioned just before we left here about how many pints you need to become a vet or how much money you need behind you as a family, even with the pints. Now you can win the lotto and not have a pint of your name or never done your leaving cert and buy a veterinary practice and employ vets who, by my reading of your own report, you would then will not have the authority or the power to regulate. It will be me, the owner of the practice, who will be answerable to you, who is not a practitioner, so I am not actually answerable to you, and my employees are answerable to me. Like, you have nullified your own role, in my opinion, and you have overstepped the mark in what wasn't your role at all, uh, by your own admission. You had to go and seek legal advice, private, personal legal advice, as to the ownership, which wasn't, that, that should have been the hardball back to the Minister straight away, or back here. We do legislative scrutiny here. It would be up to us to look at 54 too. That's our role, it's not your role or a private barrister or solicitor or whoever you employed. And then, as Deputy Penrose said in conclusion, you still went on and acted while you had done the prudent thing maybe in having a report formed, but you didn't wait for the outcome of the report. There are veterinary practices being purchased as we speak, which now are above and beyond regulation. Why the urgency and what was the catalyst for doing what you'd done? Thanks, Chair, and I'm sorry if there's repetition in there. Oh, no, fine, fine, Sergeant. Yeah, I can do that one, yeah. Uh, because it, in fair, well, you know, go ahead, go ahead. I'll let the Register <laughs> begin, but in fairness, it was before her time. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Daly. Um, in terms of the, um, the role of the Veterinary Council, it is a statutory body, so it would... It is right and proper that it would seek its own legal advice. It simply doesn't have the option to go to the Attorney General or to come into this committee and ask that this committee would interpret it. Um, the practice of veterinary medicine is carried out by individuals. Those individuals are on the registers uh, maintained by the Veterinary Council. So there is no question but that the practice of veterinary medicine is squarely being regulated and will continue to be regulated. And the Veterinary Council is very strong in ensuring that the integrity of veterinary medicine and its services across the country will always be uh, under its watchful eye and the standards enjoyed by, uh, by all the stakeholders around the country uh, held to a high standard. In the period of consultation, of course it's regrettable that there wasn't a period of consultation before these changes took place. But there has been a very robust period of consultation that is ongoing and that consultation has illuminated a number of issues which will now be considered by the Council in due course following receipt of that report. I might hand over to the President to... Yeah, in fairness, it was considered for a period in our Legislative and Ethics Committee, uh, this whole, decision, this whole uh, question, because we were being asked, and in fairness, practices, we were being told, practices were being bought, practices were being sold, corporates were buying them, and within our code, there were certain parts of it that would lead you to think that our interpretation went against what a, a, another interpretation of the Act might be. We did have legal advices, which, as somebody has said here earlier, uh, depends on which barrister you get and what questions you ask, you get different 
answers all the time, which can be confusing. We actually did ask the Attorney General. We did ask the Minister, not the Minister with the Department of Agriculture, but in fairness, we were told to seek our own legal advice. So we did seek our own legal advice. However, and we've said it, and I've said it, and I'll say it again, you know, to Anbro Noring, it's, it's, it's no doubt about it, with the benefit of hindsight, far, far better the review had occurred beforehand. And that was why it was hardly the very next meeting we attended that we put a line to it. And we said, this really needs, because the ownership, an owner in itself is not, as I said a, a few times already, I don't want to go back over it, it was the operation of the practices. Why was operation removed. Operation was removed because the Veterinary Council of Ireland recognised that this, the operation of the practice is the only place that the Act permits us to regulate the practice of veterinary medicine. And that's what we were doing and that's what we will be doing and in the consultation very, very likely, and I can't predict, Council has to make that final decision, but very, very likely it's the operation of a veterinary practice and who is providing the service and who has their hands on the wheel. That is very firmly, the Act is quite clear on it, very firmly in the hands of the practitioners who are in that practice. And they cannot be entering, and if you say there is a, a boss above them that allows them to, uh, to, diminute, to, to, to reduce their abilities to carry out what they should be carrying out, that can't be. That can't be. They are answerable to the Veterinary, Veterinary Practice Act, they're answerable to the Veterinary Council, to the codes, to the regulations, any limitations that are put on the certificate of suitability for the practice uh, premises uh, that opens to provide that service. And that's where our focus will be. The owner issue, it's not that we don't care, but the owner issue is a secondary and it's not in the Act. We can't actually go in there. Do we want legislative change? We weren't looking for legislative change. We weren't looking for it. We were being asked a specific question and there's no doubt about it. Several times we had said, no, seek your own legal advice, seek your own legal advice. We actually asked the Department and they told us to seek our own legal advice. The Attorney General said they couldn't do it. So seek our own legal advice was our line for a very long time, but practices were being purchased uh, this thing was developing. It, it's something across the whole world. So we needed to make some statement. That was one we made. Very quickly we realised we need to do a consultation. And our focus will be on who's actually providing the service. How are they providing the service? And how that service has to remain completely independent in the hands of the vets and of the nurses that are working at that practice or from that premises. The farmer at all we're extraordinarily proud of the vets, ladies, gentlemen that have gone and educated and are working on the northern, western, southern seaboards, right across the 26 counties, Mallon to Mizzen, as I say. Uh, they're providing a fantastic service that we're extraordinarily proud of. Uh, it's very tough to provide that. We recognise that. N none better than those of us who are actually giving that service. We recognise it. And it will, in time, one of our roles is to promote the practice of veterinary medicine. It will, in time, require investment of some sort to maintain these practices. They are required. We're not like the post office that's leaving the villages. We are not like the banks that are leaving the towns. We're still there, you can still, and that is the role of the Council is to ensure that we don't make any changes that might in any way affect that service that's currently there. That will be our focus in what it is. But at all times we'll be focusing that the VET has autonomy of service. That what the Cahir or the um, Deputy Cahal uh, just mentioned there, there is nobody else going to say who does what when. If the cow is a prolapse, it's the vet that's called. The vet will decide how to deal with that prolapse or if they're in a position to do it or if there's somebody that's even better in a position to do it. But it will not be a case that I'm involved in some contract that doesn't allow me to do that service. That cannot be the case. Their hands are, they, they will be regulated and they will be the providers of that service for award. Otherwise, 54 to 2C is quite clear on that. Or Section 54, to, 54 anyway is quite clear on who can provide that service for award. Otherwise. So, if no, that answers, sorry. sorry. I just want to, sorry, the, the agency, Senator Lumber and Senator Mulherm. Can I combine just briefly, Chair, on, on, on that answer to my question? Just, okay, you didn't start with the Attorney General, you were advised to take your own advice, you've explained all that. When your own advice came back, then did it not highlight issues with 54, 54 to in particular, that you then would have thought it may be prudent to go back and highlight to the Department, we may have an issue here rather than just taking that advice for Batham and running based on the advice that you've, you've said yourself can be got in any direction you want to get, depending on the questions you ask. Do you not think then you should have reversed the process and go back and highlighted with the department there may be issues based on the advice we've got, there may be issues here, maybe there's a need for, 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 for legislation or a change of legislation. Why did you just accept the advice and run, and run with it? 
Uh, well, in fairness, the Department of Agriculture would be aware of what it is we're doing. Uh, at all times, they get their annual report, but we would be meeting with them, uh, the executive meet with the staff in the Department of Agriculture four or five times a year. I think my registrar will answer that for me. Uh, we would meet them. Uh, we were in only yesterday with the uh, um, Secretary-General, uh, we would meet at different times. So they would have been aware that we were chewing on this one. It was to them we asked, they knew. We weren't going running looking for legislative change. It's not something that can be get terribly easily or very quickly or anything like that. And this was something that we had an act. We knew what was in the act. We knew what was very clear that was in the act. You're right, there's not, and I've said it a few times, far, far better have we done the review before the December 17, and that's why in 2018 we said stop, actually stop, because operation, this is all about operation, not about ownership, because exactly as Deputy Cahill has said to me, but if he's an owner and he starts, well, the owner isn't in the Act, that's our difficulty, it's the operator that's in the Act, the person that's providing the service, and that's a vet and must always be a vet. That's quite clear that's in the Act, that's what we're working on, and it's in the Code of Conduct we, we do those. If I could, and I don't know if, if, I, if I can at this stage, there's mention of, of uh, education, there's mention of going abroad. The two senators that haven't got in already um, yeah. come in and then we can come back to that. Deputy, uh, Senator Lombard and Senator Mulhern. Thank you, Chair. I realise I had to leave for a vote. Um, I'll be very brief. I'm going to pick you up halfway through what's happening. If you could actually go through the timelines regarding before this, this December 17, um, how much actual internal conversations was there about actually changing the actual code itself? Where did that happen? What actual focus was that actually on itself? You might then follow through the actual timelines afterwards. Was there a change in staff at the actual organisation? If there was, when did that happen? How did that change in staff happen and why did it happen? Did you might elaborate, was there a change in board members and if there was change in board members and go through the actual process itself? Because the actual confusion out there and the word in the street was there was major changes in the organisation over that six months period. We need to get clarity on what were the changes, why did it happen and where are we now in the actual process itself. I realise you're going through public consultation, but we just need to find out the history of how we actually got here. Mr. Scannell, uh, an issue which has been raised by a number of uh, rural veterinary practitioners, uh, particularly along the western seaboard. Um, they believe that they've been totally neglected by the Veterinary Council, and in particular that um, your refusal to intervene uh, to ensure that uh, it, in relation to the vet school in UCD that we are getting more than just vets who are, uh, want to go into small animal practice and that basically we're not producing, as we've all said, enough vets uh, for cattle practice and that there's a shortage of cattle vets in rural Ireland. And another issue highlighted is that such is the situation that uh, vets qualified in other countries with lesser qualifications have been brought in who have no experience of uh, large animal practice in practice. So, for example, such vets may not have experience in relation to surgery on uh, a, a, a cow, a caesarean, and it's leading to complications in relation to animal welfare. And I would just like you to respond to that and to set out how you are uh, addressing this issue because whether you know the, the whole issue of, a co of corporate entities being created, um, the, the first step is that there isn't enough vets there and, and what can and will be done to try and address the situation uh, that prevails at the moment. And I just want to say that uh, a lot of these vets that have complained are talking about severe emotional and physical uh, distress and pressure in trying to keep up with the workload uh, that they have and we all know it's a very heavy type of job dealing with large animals and uh, if you're under pressure you could easily get injured so it's, it's a far from desirable situation and of course because it's not been addressed it's driving more Irish qualified vets away from large animal practice because you have no life. Thank you. Uh, I, I, if I'll answer that one, if I may, um, Senator Mulher and um, uh, totally elected by the Veterinary Council and the Western Seaboard. I, I think it might be a little bit unfair. There's no doubt uh, we recognised that it's hard to get large animal practitioners quite a few years ago, four, five, six, seven years ago. UCD, in fairness, are a top, top, top class college. 
and it's world renowned, so much so that the, the um, graduates that come out of UCD have the whole world at their feet and very often they will go abroad to get their uh, further education. We recognise that a lot of those what traditionally would have gone on to the register here at home in Ireland almost straight away and go into large animal practice. The times had changed. A lot of those graduates with the very high points, as is mentioned here, very high achieving students and very high achieving vets coming out at the far side, didn't actually want to go working in the large animal uh, world we wouldn't be able to control to make them want to go. But what has happened, which is good, is that a lot of Irish uh, undergraduates who couldn't gain access into the Irish school are actually going abroad and educating and coming back. And only this year we noted that there were more new graduates from abroad coming. Now that has its own connotations and we will have to look at those. But they're coming back in. These are Irish boys and girls who have gone abroad and my own daughter is over there at the moment studying. She's in her second year. So, and there's many others. So there were more came onto the register as new graduates from foreign colleges or from the Dublin school. But in fairness, one must um, temper that particular comment by saying that the Dublin graduates, in fairness, can go working in the USA, can go working in Australia, can go much, much wider field than the Irish graduates that go abroad for their education and come home. But that has helped. There's no doubt 26 from Budapest and 14 from Warsaw came onto the register as new graduates to go working. Almost every one of those indicated to us in the Veterinary Council that they were going working in the large animal field. So they're an extra tranche coming in, on board. so we're glad to see it. We recognised it, but it actually the market is solving itself. That is to be seen across the, uh, across the board. The Can I just briefly say, I, I don't know that they'd accept that, but what I would ask you is that that just sounds like the market is correcting itself. What particular interventions, even if they're not within your competence, would you suggest happen in order to address this situation rather than to see many of our students going abroad and the issue of points has been highlighted um, which doesn't always reflect uh, the aptitude or the suitability of somebody to actually be uh, a vet no more yeah. than with a doctor. What, what, what would you suggest? In, in recognition, in re and I will ask Sergeant to, to come in very quickly on this one, in recognition of that, we are in contact with UCD, that was asked very early on here this afternoon, we're in contact very regularly with UCD, we would have made contact with them, that we are finding that there's less and less vets available, there were jobs being advertised and nobody to apply for them in the large animal work, where there was plenty of, of applicants for the small animal work or equine work. We recognise that we have been in contact, it's very difficult to just change, you can't enforce when somebody is qualified as a vet, you can't and say you must go working but we recognize there was a need to do something but as I said the market is correcting itself but we still recognize that we're not going to sit there we know that we would like to go visiting and we are going to explore that but I will I'll hand you over to the registrar because in fairness this is just unfolding uh, currently as part of our strategy and um, Senator Mulhern thank you for your question um I suppose ultimately that's a matter for policy and that is bigger than simply the Veterinary Council. Um, the Veterinary Council does have access to a huge amount of data in terms of the, you know, the number of registrants on, on its roles, their profile, their ages, where they're in practice. Um, and that data is something that will probably form uh, or come under consideration in the strategy. It might be that the Council over the coming years will carry out some research to produce some reports which will seek to inform and influence policies in that very area. But it is outside of the, uh, I suppose the, the sole control of the Veterinary Council, but it is an area that is being discussed by the Veterinary Council. I can say no more than that on the matter. You reference um, challenges uh, to the profession. The health, the well-being, you know, the, the, the stressful environment that uh, many of the profession find themselves, and that is absolutely acknowledged by the, by the Council. The Council, through its Code of Conduct and a lot of other initiatives, including a booklet, Safe Vet, produced a number of years ago, um, to give some guidance and support and to acknowledge the, the strains and the pressures that are out there on, on registrants in practice. Um, it's a very worthy, worthy initiative. Um, that is in existence, it's on the website, it's given to all your, uh, new graduates um, and you know, new entrants to the register. Um, and I can also say that the Veterinary Council supports a number of um, initiatives in that area to protect the health and well-being uh, and to support their registrants in the public interest. Deputy Kenny, did you want to raise? Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Um, uh, fairness, yes. uh, uh, set, uh, set, so how much time and was there a change and yes yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well register I know you start and you can yeah. I might give an outline and then yeah. you'll uh, come in after me. Um, 
Senator Lombard, my apologies. So, you ask about the process in terms of decisions. So, uh, there are committees uh, that support the work of the Veterinary Council. Um, the Legislation and Ethics Committee, as was referenced here previously by one of your colleagues, um, considered this matter over a long period of time, as my own President outlined. Um, ultimately, that committee made a number of recommendations to the Council. Those recommendations uh, were considered by the Council in December 2017, uh, and the Veterinary Council took decisions uh, following those recommendations. Um, you talk about, you know, so I suppose that is the process. Uh, as with any regulator, there are a number of committees that support the work of the overarching Council. Um, you talk about, uh, or you question, you know, changes in personnel. I'm not sure that that's fair or relevant. Um, you know, the decision of the Veterinary Council as a body corporate is the decision of the Veterinary Council. Uh, you know, and in terms of personnel or individuals, uh, you know, beneath that, it's of no relevance. Right. So you're not going to say if it was changed the personnel in the actual well, institution sorry, itself? Well, I, I could answer. There, 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 there is a very large change, but it's a body in per per perpetuity. It's set up by yeah. the Act. So at all times there are changes. And usually the Act, in fact, it was a clever enough Act the way it was set up that we were um, moved in and moved out at different periods. At a two-year, there was five would come for election, and then the next two years, four would come for election. They were the nine elected members. The appointed members would sit for four years, but they would... Uh, come in and go. Some of them would stay for four years, some of them would stay a shorter period, and some would stay for a second term of the four years. As it happened, and it was only a coincidental of, of time, as it happens, there were only five members, I think either four or five, I, I'm not absolutely sure, either four or five, that were remaining after 2017 into 2018. But, but in fairness, it's a body in perpetuity. A decision of council made in 2005 is a decision of council made in 2005. So the decisions would be made, they wouldn't be made uh, because we are now changed, therefore we're all different, but the whole changing is to give different thought process and to give different input and, and different background. So as, as our registrar has said, I, I think it would be an unfair line to say it's to do with the fact that there was a huge I change. I just asked yeah. you for clarity, was there a change okay. of registrar? Oh, there, uh, there was a change of registrar then almost immediately. I went in as president and in fairness to the registrar, she, had, uh, she was 15, 14 years with us at the time and she gave us three months notice which meant the registrar at the uh, middle of January, I think, was until the end of April. Then we had an interim, um, we had an interim uh, CEO, a registrar, and then a second interim CEO while we were trying to recruit. And now we have recruited our full-time CEO. Yeah. So there was changes, and, and they themselves. I mean, it's a long time. 2018, January, and here we are in in the summer of 2019. We would be far, far happier had we concluded this a lot quicker. But the change of the registrar and new committee members coming on would have added to the difficulty of getting to the right to the bottom. But but we're almost there. Yeah, just in relation to in your opening statement, in the, the there's independent statutory regulator. You, you have a, a sentence there that the veterinary council statutory body responsible for regulation and management of veterinary professions, being veterinary practitioners and veterinary nurses in Ireland. And you repeat the same paragraph further on. Um, to me, what you're saying there is, and I go back to to the the, the the act that you know, and in section 54, which is about in relation to the practice in relation to offences in relation to the practice of veterinary medicine and the use of the title. Basically, whether the practice, you regulate the practice, whether the practice is owned by a corporate or owned by an individual or owned by a partnership or owned by whatever, your job is to regulate the practice. Is that, is that a correct statement to make? Because it, it, that comes to the nub of this. Because the problem here is that if the practice is a corporate, how are you able to regulate it appropriately? Or are you setting conditions? Are you actually uh, issuing a certificate to the corporate or issuing a certificate to the, to the vet? If you're issuing to the vet, well, the vet is employed by the corporate. I mean, you're going to have to regulate the corporate. And if you're not prepared to do that, then you're advocating your responsibilities. Or if, uh, yeah, if I, well, you answer first, sorry. Sure. So the practice of veterinary medicine is the delivery, um, it's the verb, the practice of veterinary medicine. That is carried out by individuals. So, you know, a body corporate can't go out, uh, you know, you talked about sectioning, uh, you know, uh, animals. Um, it is 
The practice of veterinary medicine is carried out by individuals. Those individuals are on the register as maintained and safeguarded by the Veterinary Council. Um, you know, they come through programmes of education accredited by the Veterinary Council. They're subject to continuing professional development overseen by the Veterinary Council. Um, you know, they, they remain on the register. They're subject to, uh, you know, to the Code of Conduct, they're subject to fitness to practice uh, rigours of the Veterinary Council. That delivery of service is by individuals, and those individuals carry out the practice of veterinary medicine. So they are absolutely and utterly being regulated at all times, and that will not change. So the practice is not regulated? The individuals on the register deliver the practice of veterinary medicine. So uh, really, uh, the point I'm coming to, and to concur with Deputy Penrose, is that there seems to be a hole when it comes to corporate taking over or corporate uh, becoming predominant within the sector, there seems to be a hole in the legislation that the corporate, as the owner of the practice, will not be regulated by anyone, as we can see. And I think that there's, really, there's clearly a, a hole in the act here that needs to be filled. If, sorry. Sorry. Very the committee, that That's a subcommittee, isn't it? It has to be. I mean, look, the Veterinary Council is there and you have a subcommittee dealing with uh, legislation and ethics, and then you have a disciplinary committee, I'm sure, and they're all subcommittees. So they're not really, uh, I don't agree with your definition of them that they're bound, but uh, what I want to know is how many members are on that, how many members are on the Legislative and Ethics Committee, how many members participated in the vote in December, and you get a vote on the 14th of December, because the decision was conveyed on the 15th of December, how many members, was, was the decision to make the changes unanimous? Did, was it was a decision to make the changes, and, and did anybody feel compelled to absent themselves in relation to having a conflict of interest at the meeting, at that particular meeting? As we've referenced previously, and I really don't want to uh, sound like a broken record, but any decision of the Veterinary Council is a decision of the Council as a body corporate. That decision is taken by the Council itself. Yes, the Council has the benefit and the support of uh, committees considering individual matters which would make recommendations to the Council, but ultimately any decision is by the Veterinary Council, the body corporate. But, but hold on now, hold on now, you can't let that horse run away without getting... The Legislative and Ethics Committee met on, was it, what day, was it the 14th of December? They made a decision. Was it unanimous? You should be able to answer that. Or was it not? Were there abstentions? Were there people... The, the, the absented themselves. That's number one. Number two, if what you're saying is correct, that meeting of a subcommittee must be brought down to the full veterinary council to endorse it. Well, the GC didn't go as quick because on the 14th of December you met. This, 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 the haste associated with this decision is mind boggling. He's met the 14th December, not you, 14th December. He's took a decision. And I'd love to know whether it's unanimous or not, but I, I'm not going to find out. But I could hazard a guess. Then, on the 15th December, up on the website goes the decision. Now, when did the Veterinary Council convene to endorse that decision of, your, of the Legislative and Ethics Committee? So, Senator Penrose, the decision in December 2017 was taken by the Veterinary Council. It had the benefit of recommendations of a, of a committee that it uh, supported. Who only met the previous day? Committee. No, no. It, it had, sorry, it was earlier. It was earlier, Deputy Penrose. It was earlier. Um, uh, the meeting in December that is referred to in December 17 was a meeting at the full council. And it was a, a proposal coming forward from the LEC, which had met earlier, quite a few weeks earlier. And I'm sure they don't usually meet in the week beforehand. It's usually several weeks beforehand to have the papers ready for the full council. So it would have been a several weeks. So the decision was made inside. And I'm not 100% sure. I'm a registrar would have to tell me for us to be talking about unanimity and who shouted against it and who shouted against it. Are you arrested? It'd be very, it'd be very interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm you know, not certain. I, I think we'll well, be the answer is if the user entity God is of OTA as well, openness and transparency, the accountability. Nijinsky, Arkel, you're going back a few years now. We'll I am, yeah. you know, Tiger roll might be a better one. <laughs> well, but, the better one for me because it'd be a home one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but in fairness, those issues, those issues, I'm not really certain really benefit the whole the whole question here. The whole question here, I think, as Deputy Cal put it. Yeah. Like, this act was 2005. There was, the act was fine until December 2017, and then there was changes made to it, and then in January he got worried about the changes, 
And like I think Deputy Penrose, in my view, and the other, the other, the other members, like, were not happy with this process, and were not at all happy with it. And uh, like, why, you know, as, as you said yourself, there should have been consultation bef before particular changes were made. But like, it, it, it's, as, as has been said, there's been undue haste in the decision. And we here, as, a, as an Arctis committee, are concerned with the process. And that's putting it, that's putting it mildly. I, I think we, we do glean that and we garnish that completely from you. We ourselves, there's no doubt, we do not look, look back and say that that was our finest hour. We do know that the consultation, of course, should have occurred before 2017, now with the benefit of hindsight. But we're calling that in the rear view. We're saying good will come of this. We are going to. We are seriously chewing this issue. And exactly as Deputy Kennedy has, has mentioned there, uh, you know, if corporates are buying, what's going to happen? Who's owning the practice? Who's running the practice? Who's... It's the running of the practice is the focus of the veterinary Council. It's who's providing the service for third party or otherwise, or for reward or otherwise to a third party. And that's where we've always been. There have been, I mean, if I just take, if the, a practitioner owned a practice and a practitioner were married, does his spouse own half it? Is that a law of the land? So ownership was not one that we went into, it was the operation of the practice that we went into. If we happen to be borrowed in the bad times, which I can personally tell you, the bank owned a lot more of me than I ever owned, but the bank cannot influence my decisions and it cannot tell me how many blood tests to run or how many x-rays or how many bottles of this or whatever. Those decisions are mine and mine only. I'm operating the practice, I'm providing the service, I'm putting them out there to a third party or other and the Act is quite clear on that quite clear of it. And a body corporate cannot, nor can a vet help a body corporate get involved in that. A body corporate cannot provide that service. Uh, any service, and it says it, any act, matter or thing, the performance of which forms part of the practice of veterinary medicine. That is vet and vet only, when it's veterinary medicine. Nurse, nurse only, when it's veterinary nursing. And that's the part, that will come out. As I say, we're slightly... We, we, Niamh and myself were a little bit... It would be nicer if we were coming into you when our consultation had completed and that we could say to you where it is we have come to with this. And I, we, we, would, we would offer that we would be available to do that the, the, the moment we would have more information yeah. on it. Well, but that's I, where we're... I accept focused. that that's fine, but like, uh, while, while from January 18 to, to, to today, May, May, May 19, sales of practices are, are still ongoing. And you have a consultation process in place but the handbrake has never been pulled up. And like, as, it, as it stands, when I can see anyone that wants to sell their practice is going to have it done before this consultation process is over. So like, to come back in here and tell us the result of the consultation process is grand, but if it, if it comes to a conclusion that was different to the decision taken in December 17, um, the horse is bolted. Well, if and I, I can't answer... understand, when, when, you, when you went down the process of doing a consultation process, why there wasn't a, 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 a clause put in that while the consultation process is on, um, sale of practices can only be done as they were here to fall. Well, in fairness, the sale of practices has been going back from the year dot. The sale of practices has been going in the 70s, 50s, 40s, right oh, back. No, right no, up. no, I'm not, uh, that, that's fine. It was sold between vets. And I saw my own vet retired and his practice was sold on. And it was another practice usually bought it. But the sale of practices to, to corporate entities wasn't always going on. No, it wasn't, you're right, and, and, and we recognise that this was something that was coming, it was occurring in every other state across the world almost, uh, corporate practices, but uh, the sale of practices was something the Veterinary Council could never and was never involved in, can't stop, we have no legislative powers to stop the sale, the purchase, any of that, and many, many practices had those in them, had investment partners in them that would not themselves be vets, but it was the vet, the actual service that was provided by that practice. That's the service that we regulated and have always regulated. So we couldn't have, in 2018, made any statements about it if we weren't doing it in 2008 and 2000 or 1998. We never were ever involved in the sale or purchase or handover of any of those, handing up. To, there are sons of vets who, who would have been left practices in wills. I don't know. We, we never were involved in it, uh, to do it shortly. So we don't have the legislative power to do that. Having said that, Having said that, the word owner is often used because you're talking about operating. Now, operation is different. We're very involved in that. And the operation of a veterinary practice is a veterinary practitioner only. If a veterinary practitioner is operating the veterinary practice, and a corporate body decides that what a veterinary practice and is a mixed practice, and they decide, look, we're only going to focus on small animals here. 
What do you do? The veterinary, the veterinary practitioner is operating the practice. The what, assumption, do you, what, what, what do you do? What, the, what the do you do to the, to the 50 farmers around that area that now suddenly have no vet? This, the sudden decision that there is a corporate involved in it, that's not something that we're at all getting involved in. The, the provision of the service to that farmer was by the vets and the vets only. If they enter into some uh, arrangement with somebody else that affects their ability to give a service, and then there's complaints about it, we will be examining those complaints. But it's the vet we would be answerable to. Sorry. You're all about your basically saying the vet is who you're account. You, you can bring the vet to task. So the policy of the veterinary practice is going to be a, B, C and D, whatever it is, small animals only. That's all we're going to deal with. And that's the policy of the corporate they set up. So what you're proposing here, that if a vet doesn't, or goes out, a vet sticks to that policy and doesn't take into consideration large animals, you're going to be stepping into that remit and you're going to be saying the vet has to have that practice of dealing with all animals. Like, this is the real core issue here. We have multiples that could buy up practices and say we're dealing with the cash customer that can pay us, that's going to be financially beneficial, and we don't want the agricultural industry involved. So you're saying if that practice was to happen, you will step in and you wouldn't be attacking the corporate, you'd be attacking the operator. Is that true? I didn't actually say that. No, sorry, I didn't say that. What, Explain what, to me, sir. Yeah, so. OK. So what we're saying is, before any corporate at all gets involved anywhere, and, and yes, it's recognised there are corporates out there doing something, whatever they are, we do not know and we do not get involved in that aspect of it. What we're saying is that the only person who can provide the service, be it to small animal or to large animal, the only person who can influence the it's service, be it a small animal to large animal, the only person who can decide we're going to do X or we're going to do Y is the veterinary practitioner, veterinary practitioner The only person he can only. sanction is the vet, is that true? That's all that the Act allows so, us, yes, only so, registered. So yeah. if you had a corporate that had a policy that was excluding large animals, the only person that you can sanction isn't the corporate, is the vet. That's so, very true. Sorry. If, so we're if dealing there was with a, a fourth scenario party now. involved. We're dealing with a scenario that a corporate policy might end up having the vet personnel being the person sanctioned for the policy of the corporate. But what we're saying to you is that there isn't a fourth party. The first party is the vet. We are the regulators, the second party. The third party is the animal owner. The provision of services to the animal owner. There's no fourth party. Not in our Act. Not allowed in our Act. There's no fourth party. But you, and that's you still only can regulate the vet? We, can, we only regulate the vet. We could not allow. Our core principle, our core, our core function, is the, the regulation of the practice of veterinary medicine. And the Act only allows us to regulate the practice of veterinary medicine and the registrants that are there. So we could not go against our core function. And our core function would be to be allowing the development of a fourth party in there. There's no room for the fourth party. It's the vet provides the service. The owner asks for the service and we regulate it. The owner is the third party, we're the regulator. Has there ever That's been it. a complaint put in that a vet wouldn't deal with a large animal and you were dealing with a policy of a vet or a corporate, which everyone to deal with, and the corporate or, or the vet was only providing a service of small animals and wouldn't deal with large animals? Has that ever come to you? Well, I'll just very quickly answer to you. I, I'd honestly say I do not know of any. I have to admit I do not know of any. But that's and, and the core element in this yeah. entire debate. And, and what I'm saying is the Act is quite clear. There is no fourth body here. There is the vets who is providing the service for reward or otherwise at and from a premise to which we've given a certificate of suitability and we are regulating that in its entirety and that's our core and primary function. Sorry, uh, Registrar. Yeah. Senator Lombard, the role as the regulator must be remembered here. It's not within the gift of the Veterinary Council to force the hand of any registrant, uh, you know, two vets in partnership down in Kerry to provide particular services. It's just not open to us. We can't control every facet of every practice around the country. What we do is oversee and supervise the integrity of the services that are provided through the access to the register for vets and veterinary nurses, through education, continuing professional development and then the fitness to practice. It is just not within the gift of any regulator to control every facet of every practice all over the country.
Senator Daly is next. Yeah, Chair, I, just, I just want to go back again. To, 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 I asked the question as to the catalyst. What was the catalyst for the change? Uh, if I can just quote from, from the, the submission that was made here, the background. Historically, Section 54.2 of the Veterinary Practitioners Act 2005 was interpreted to prevent a body corporate from owning a veterinary practice. So, from its inception to December 17, stroke, January 18, you were working based on your interpretation that it was illegal or wouldn't be allowed for a corporate to buy a veterinary practice. Now, you said earlier that veterinary practice has been changing hands. That's no problem. But you were working, that's here in black and white, in your own report. Why did you change your interpretation or did you seek legal advice to change your interpretation? And why, as has been asked before, did you change your interpretation of the Act, of the section of the Act, in a matter of two months, when things had worked from 2005 to 2017 with the interpretation you had? Why, what, was the catalyst, what was the catalyst for change, and why did the change happen? Like, it's frustrating in here when it comes to trying to develop, introduce, or change legislation, how long it takes. You're definitely going to be in next year's Guinness Book of Records with how you change an interpretation of a section of an act in a two-month period. Why? What was the catalyst first to start the process, and what was the catalyst for the haste? So the, <clears throat> the Code of Conduct, there were deemed to be inconsistencies within the Code. As um, the President has referenced, this matter was considered by committees over a long number of years. And ultimately, um, advices were taken and the matter considered by the Council in December 2017. And that is the basis for, uh, for the amendment. It, it wasn't taken in haste. It was considered, as uh, Pather has outlined, over a long number of years, queries coming into the, into the Veterinary Council. The Veterinary Council acts in the public interest and the best interests of animal health and welfare. So if there are inconsistencies, it is important that it, can, it carries out its role in making sure that the, you know, the position of the Council is clear for the benefit of the registrants, the public interest and uh, best interests of animal health and welfare. Um, yes, it's regrettable that there wasn't a, a period of consultation in advance of those amendments, but following a reaction based on that amendment, um, a very thorough period of consultation has been conducted since. Um, those, all of the stakeholders and all of the engagements will be reflected in a report. All of the issues that have been illuminated for the Council will all be considered in time, and the Veterinary Council you know, take whatever action it believes appropriate. <coughs> So you, basically what you're saying is the decision was made that it was in the best interest of animal health and welfare, veterinary practitioners' health and welfare, farmers' health and welfare and progress, that you make this decision and you change your interpretation that corporates could now buy veterinary practices. What I said was that the, uh, the decision was taken to avoid any, any, inter any misinterpretation or any inconsistencies in the code. We would, if I could. Sorry, we would have recognised that uh, multinationals were around, or corporates were around. We would have known that there was. We were being told, "Oh, they're buying this, they're buying that." We were, uh, you know. Uh, now we don't have any direct, absolute evidence, and we, even to this day, some references are made to certain practices. We would have as little or as much information as you have yourselves, but not enough for us to be making absolute um, uh, statements of fact on it. Uh, a catalyst, we had been asked a good few times, is this possible? Can I do it? Can I sell? Can I buy? And that was going on the whole time. Uh, and in fairness, it was being considered at the LEC, uh, the Legislative and Ethics Committee. And then it did make its recommendation. It was in an effort to clarify, but immediately we recognised it actually confused more than clarified. And that's why we put in the consultation process. And as I say, we would love to come back to you, uh, if we could come back when we have the report. I'm very frustrated with the last few hours and what we've gone through here. I think it's nearly a line of self-regulation gone mad here. I'm quite disappointed with, uh, with the answers. When will we have this, this actual report? I think with the, deep, with the deepest respect, like the 15th of December 2000 or the deep, uh, December 2017 is a long time ago. This is a really important issue. The thing that we don't have that report before us by now is absolutely amazing. Like, I want to know, will this report be published in the next few days, weeks, months, or will it, will it be going years? Or is that really where we're going at this? Because, Chairman, 
I've been here for the last three or four years. We've had an awful lot of hearings, and I've been at most of them. I think this is one of the most important issues that's come before us. It's about who actually owns our veterinary practices. It's about where is our veterinary practices going forward. It's a big issue on the ground. I'm a bit annoyed at the answers and the lack of clarity we've got this morning or this afternoon. I think we need to get this report published and need to be brought back to as soon as we can. Okay, Mr. O'Scannell, have we, have we a timeline for the report? Uh, it, it's imminent. It, hardly days, but definitely not years, and hardly even into months, so hopefully weeks towards months. We're hoping in the summertime that this will be. Okay, so you think that before our summer recess, you may have an opportunity to come back before us? The summer recess would be? Mid July, roughly. Mid July. We would hope, I'm our registrar's here with us, we would hope we have two meetings, one in June and we have one in July. Okay. It will, it, it, if we've only one year in June, so it's probably more the July meeting that would, would be finished with. Okay. So if it's possible, we'll try and get you in before, before we finish up, obviously, before we the summer. We want this finished with as well, in fairness, and it has. We had a change of uh, CEO, we had a change of registrar, we had a huge change of personnel. So in fairness, that didn't uh, speed things up, it did the exact opposite. So we would like to be finished with this, as one of the council members has described as sucking the oxygen out of the room. It is taking way too much uh, um, effort, and we just need to clarify it and finish it. Okay. Thanks, members. That completes this, this part of me. We look forward to seeing you back, obviously. Your apologies, I had to slip out there for questions and it all myself there earlier on. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you, obviously, sooner rather than later, to, to complete the process, if we could put it as such, from our point of view. Uh, thank you very much for coming before us today, and the meeting is suspended briefly to get the next group of witnesses in before us. Thank you very much again for coming before us. Okay, Michelle, no problem. They'll be back up for some of you. Okay, the meeting is now resumed in public session. 
Uh, just before we begin to my members uh, and the witnesses as normal to make sure the mobile phones are completely turned off, please. Uh, and we're here today to discuss, this was the ongoing discussion we have here at the committee, uh, the future of the beef sector in the context of Food Waste 2025. I'd like to thank uh, the representatives from Borbia, uh, Ms. Tara McCarthy, Chief Executive, Mr. Paul Brennan, Director of Meat, Food and Beverages, and Mr. Joe Brooks, Senior Manager of Meat and Livestock, for coming before the committee today. Uh, and also thank you for sub making our submission as well here earlier on. Uh, but just to issue a privilege before we begin, I want to bring to your attention witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of your evidence. That you give to the committee. However, if directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualify a privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings to be given. You are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect of where possible. We should not criticise or make charges against any person or entity by name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on or criticise or make charges against either person outside the House or an official leader by name. In such ways to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, I understand you're making an opening statement now, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, Mr. Chairman, committee members, I'd like to thank the committee for the invitation to discuss the future of the Irish beef and livestock sector and its markets in the context of Foodwise 2025. I'm joined, as you mentioned, this afternoon by my colleagues Podrick Brennan, who's the Director of Sectors, and Joe Burke, our Senior Manager for Meat and Livestock. Chairman, with the agreement of your committee, I'd like to focus on the recent performance of the Irish beef and livestock sector, and I hope to address some of the issues being experienced as a result of the difficult market conditions at present. As you all know, the Irish beef and livestock sector plays a key role in the Irish economy, with over 100,000 farms involved in cattle production. And in 2018, from a supply base of approximately 1 million suckler cows and 1.5 million dairy cows, Irish beef production reached over 630,000 tonnes, of which 90% was exported. Notwithstanding the serious challenges being faced by the sector, which I will touch on in a moment, Irish beef exports were valued at a record £2.5 billion last year, which represents a growth of 20% in comparison to the baseline period from 2012 to 2014, on which the Foodwise 2025 targets were set. Over the same timeline, Irish cattle throughput at export meat plants increased by approximately 300,000 head, with significantly more animals coming from the dairy herd since EU quota abolition in 2015. This contributed to an additional 90,000 tonnes of beef available for export. In relation to market channels, there has been a dramatic advancement in the number of European retailers and major food service customers committed to buying Irish beef, which now total more than 115 key accounts. As a result, Irish beef exports into retail are estimated to have grown by 30,000 tonnes, with a similar increase in the volume being sold into the quick service restaurant chains. These developments have been brought about as a result of the enviable reputation which Irish beef has achieved across key markets, based on its unique attributes of grass-based production, family farms and a high-quality product. The importance of these attributes was clearly highlighted by in-depth research undertaken by Board Bia over the past year, with 22,000 consumers in 13 markets across Europe, Asia, the Middle East and North America. In markets close to home, where Ireland is well known, such as the UK, Germany, France, the Netherlands and Italy, Irish product is strongly associated with terms such as grass-fed, pasture-raised, natural production and a clean environment. In markets in Asia, such as China and Japan, Ireland's natural production system and robust food safety systems are, and will continue to be, key to building the reputation for Irish beef. Of course, Borbia is also acutely aware of the difficulties being experienced by Irish beef farmers, particularly since last autumn. Irish or three steer prices were below the comparable European average male cattle prices for most of the past nine months and have fallen by an average of 6% or 23%, or 23 cent per kilo for the year to date in comparison with the same period in 2018. And it should, however, be acknowledged in recent years that the improved market position of Irish beef has enabled cattle prices here to move closer to and indeed exceed EU average producer prices. Our steer prices have exceeded the EU 15 male cattle average in six of the last eight years. It's worth highlighting that prior to this decade, Irish prices had only exceeded the EU average in just one year for a period in 2008. Most recently, for the week 11th of May, Irish or three steer prices averaged €3.79 per kilo, excluding VAT, which represents a recovery of about 15 cents per kilo in recent weeks. And by comparison, or three in the UK are averaging 3.55 sterling per kilo, which is equivalent to about €4.09 per kilo. And across continental Europe, cattle prices are also behind last year's level, and the weighted average price for or three young bulls stands at just 3.65 per kilo. 
And whilst my colleague Podrick Brennan can go into this in further detail, let me put some context on what's happening in the market. In late 2018, the European beef sector was impacted by higher stocks of beef on the market, which was driven by higher EU production, particularly in cull cows, but also increased imports of beef into Europe, predominantly from South America. At the same time, exports of European beef into international markets recorded a 5% decline. These factors collectively resulted in an additional 188,000 tonnes onto the supply chain, equivalent of about 2.6% of total EU beef consumption. Overall exports of Irish beef increased by 3% in volume during 2018 to 573,000 tonnes. Similar to recent years, the UK market accounted for 52% of Irish beef exports, or 298,000 tonnes. Exports of Irish beef into continental Europe grew by 3% to reach 250,000 tonnes, thereby making up 44% of total exports for 2018. And meanwhile, Irish, exports of Irish beef to international markets declined to just 25,000 tonnes, and therefore represent just 4% of Irish beef exports. Another significant factor within the Irish beef trade this spring was the level of uncertainty surrounding the outcome of Brexit. It is likely that many cattle finishers took the decision to market their animals earlier in fear of the possible consequences of a no-deal Brexit. Cattle throughput has increased by 36,000 head to date this year, in spite of the analysis of the Department of Ag's AIMS system that had suggested that supplies for 2019 as a whole are likely to decline. A disorderly Brexit would clearly have serious long-lasting long consequences for the sector. The potential implications of having to find alternative markets for more than 200,000 tonnes of Irish beef are considerable in terms of the potential damage it would do to the hard-fought position of Irish beef in key markets, as each would need to absorb 60 to 70 per cent more Irish beef, and it is very unlikely to be able to do that at the prices historically achieved in the UK market. Apart from Brexit, the beef sector faces other significant challenges, including an ever-increasing stream of negative publications and campaigns that question the industry's right to exist. This includes challenges to the sustainability of red meat consumption on the grounds of health and environmental impact, with the more extreme reports calling for beef consumption to be reduced by almost 80%. For example, the recent Eat Lancet report suggests a daily red meat allowance of 14 grams per day, which would equate to less than a quarter pounder per week. Such reports are creating an increasing perception among some consumers, some consumers that red meat is not healthy, particularly among millennials, who are those aged between around 23 and 38. And as a result, there has been a substantial and a sustained rise in veganism, vegetarianism, and most particularly, flexitarianism. And this is a term coined for people who are consciously eating less animal protein. And with recent reports from Bourbia, research suggesting that up to one-fifth of consumers in some European markets fit into one of these groups, and particularly younger urban-dwelling consumers. The sector is also under ever-increasing scrutiny from NGOs in relation to animal welfare. Last autumn, a Dutch NGO published an undercover report, photographs and videos challenging the animal welfare standards on Irish fa cattle farms. In each case, the investigators, investigators gained access to the farms under false pretenses. Thankfully, the industry has been able to counteract the report's findings using the verified facts and figures from audit data that Borbia's Sustainable Beef and Lamb Assurance Scheme to reassure customers. And it is clear that the power of NGOs continues to increase and that the industry needs to have a clear plan for balancing the debate in a more proactive manner. Otherwise, it is likely to face further challenges to its social licence to operate, potentially declining consumption and, as a result, lower prices. As already mentioned, the Irish beef sector does, however, have a lot of positives that are well recognised, but producers and the industry as a whole are continuously being asked to do more. It should also be acknowledged that the sector has already embraced the Sustainable Beef and Lamb Assurance Scheme, ESPLAS, and Origin Green, thereby providing a unique infrastructure with which to successfully counteract some of these challenges. The introduction of the closeout model and a farmer help desk have encouraged membership of ESPLAS to grow to around 52,000 certified farms currently. As a result of the data collected during the audits of SBLAS farms, Board BIA is in a position to make claims to provide proof around some of our unique points of difference. For example, our data shows there's clearly space to do that on grass. Numerous international research papers have shown that grass-fed beef contains higher levels of iron and, vi and vital vitamins. Grass-fed beef can also point to higher omega-3 and CLA levels, all of which can boost its human health credentials. A specific grass-fed claim has also been shown in Borbia commissioned research at consumer and trade levels to add further marketing advantages for Irish beef. The challenge at present to making that claim is that while there has been a widespread uptake, there remain a considerable number of producers outside Esplas, which makes it impossible for Borbia to robustly make claims about the full lifetime of the animal, and this in turn can weaken the strength of the claim being made. 
to fully reflect the efforts being made on cattle farms across the country, every farmer needs to be encouraged to join the Sustainable Beef and Lamb Assurance Scheme. Regarding Origin Green, following its launch in 2012, the early stages of the rollout of Origin Green were all about building the programme, creating scale and proof points, and as a result, credibility with the market and customers. As a result of the widespread support from farmers and industry, Origin Green has become more successful than could have been anticipated. The programme has now established an awareness level of 27% among trade customers internationally, and in the more traditional markets of the UK, Germany and the Netherlands, Ireland ranks in the top five in terms of countries associated with sustainable food production. However, with success comes challenges, as both market priorities and customer demands continue to evolve. The blue chip customers purchasing Irish beef have an ever-increasing expectation that the sector can demonstrate real impact and improvement to allow them to make claims about the product on their shelves. And these evolving trends and expectations point to the need to regroup and focus on the production, marketing and promotion of Irish beef to help deliver a visible return for everyone involved in the sector. And it was against this backdrop, informed by market data and built on significant consultation with industry at both farmer and processor level, that Borbia has updated its marketing strategy for Irish beef just last year. For, for, firstly, for us, it's about focus when we look at that strategy. Ireland currently exports beef to more than 60 markets across the globe. Traditionally, Borbia tended to treat many of these markets equally, essentially following the volume of exports. As part of our new strategy, the marketing investment is being focused on a core set of priority markets, and this approach is designed to deliver a better return on investment and allow Borbia to further improve the market position of Irish beef. Germany is a good example of a priority market for Irish beef. Over the past eight years, the value of our beef exports has risen by more than 250%, growing from 45 million in 2010 to reach over 165 million euro in 2018. This reflects growth in export volumes from 9,500 tonnes to 27,000 tonnes, as well as a jump of more than 25% in the average price per tonne. Five years ago, Borbia commenced the rollout of a bespoke consumer campaign for the German market that focused on the sustainability credentials of Irish beef and focused on the family farm, family farm tradition in Ireland, which resonates strongly with German consumers. Over the period, Borbia has invested around €4 million Euro in the campaign, and under our new strategy, similar marketing campaigns are being implemented across other priority markets, such as the Netherlands and Italy. Our second priority is about new markets. It's clear that the dynamics of the global beef trade will change dramatically over the coming decade. Global beef import demand is expected to grow by more than 20%, with Asia accounting for half of this increase, rising by almost 1 million tonnes, principally driven by China. This means that regions such as Asia look set to become increasingly important outlets for Irish beef over the medium term. The reality is that many of these markets don't know much about Europe, never mind Ireland. And the key focus of Board Beer's strategy is to build awareness of Irish beef with key importers in these new markets. Borbia's awareness building activities in Asia will be supported by its execution of EU information and promotional campaigns. These campaigns generally receive 80% co-funding from the EU and therefore represent a valuable resource to highlight the supply capabilities of European beef and within that Ireland. Two campaigns are currently taking place in the Asian region under the banner Enjoy It's From Europe, including a 3.75 million euro campaign across China, Hong Kong and Japan, as well as a 4 million euro campaign covering the Philippines, South Korea and Singapore. And activities include inward study visits to Ireland, technical seminars for trade buyers, media advertising and participation in multiple trade fairs. At the same time, we are starting to see the scale of the supply challenges being faced by China and other Asian markets due to the escalation in African swine fever outbreaks. There, this has the potential to significantly change the balance of the global meat market and drive prices upwards over the course of 2019 and into the medium term. Our view, further informed further informed by our recent trade mission to China just last week, is that this market will advance even more quickly than our original plan suggested, and other Asian markets such as Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, Singapore and Philippines are also showing significant potential for Irish beef. Borbia have adjusted and continue to adjust our plans and programmes accordingly. We all know that Ireland's greatest asset in the marketplace is its reputation, which has traditionally been built on traceability and data. In order to further enhance our market position, we will need to protect and, where necessary, strengthen our credentials. The third area of focus in Borbia strategy is all about building robust proof points. These proof points will focus on grass and animal welfare in the first instance, both of which we know are of significant importance to customers. The unique infrastructure offered by SBLAS and Origin Green will play a key role in verification. Delivery on these issues will require significant collaboration and buy-in from all parties across the sector, but it will enable us to protect the reputation of Irish beef and help differentiate from our competitors. 
Finally, because the market never stands still, Borbie is committed to maintaining a focused and targeted investment in market and consumer insights to anticipate potential new market opportunities for Irish beef. There is no denying the seriousness of the current market situation and there is no denying that there are serious challenges to overcome. All parties in the sector have a role to play in overcoming these and I am committing that Borbia will play its role to help deliver the maximum return for the marketplace. Mr Chairman, I'd like to thank you and the members for your, of your committee for affording me and the team here the opportunity of addressing you this afternoon. And my colleagues and I are happy to address any questions you and the committee may wish to ask of us at this time. Thank you very much, Ms McCarthy, for your opening statement. Uh, before I uh, come to Deputy Cat, who was first in the just a question. Uh, you, uh, maybe you might enlighten the committee as regards the role you play in live exports. Uh, I think live exports obviously are a key part of the whole trade, beef trade, and I suppose competition is the life of trade, as we all know. Uh, and there would have been a lot of commentary earlier in the year about that issue, in particular about the calf part of it. Uh, you might maybe enlighten us as regards what part you play and what part you may be able to play going forward in that area. Uh, Joe? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, with regard to live exports, similar to our promotion of beef, uh, we execute campaigns with regard to the promotion of those also. And as you comment, Obviously, they, they do represent a very important source of competition and an alternative outlet uh, to, the, to the meat plants, to the export meat plants. Um, interestingly, for the year to date, overall live exports have increased by 36 per cent. And up until the begin beginning of May, there have been 173,000 cattle exported in total. Um, in fact, of the calf exports, which indeed uh, have been uh, the, the, the uh, focus of much attention this spring, um, those have increased by 33 per cent to 143,000 head. So there has been significant increases there, even on the back of last year's uh, high levels. As a result of these, calf exports are likely to reach record levels um, this year, in spite of the difficulties, obviously, which we are all too aware um, earlier this year of the capacity issue uh, in the Lairages in Cherbourg. So Borbia, um, through our uh, market office colleagues, uh, implement promotion of um, our, our live exports in those markets. So work with uh, customers in many of these markets. There are significant customers importing uh, large volumes of calves, or even indeed uh, in, uh, in other markets, uh, it, it represents uh, an outlet for weanlings or for heavier animals. Um, so uh, earlier this year, in conjunction with the, the Minister for Agriculture, we have been involved in, in uh, various um, activities, including uh, trade, um, trade visits uh, to markets over the last uh, 12 months. We have visited the Turkish market uh, in order to further grow that market. Uh, we have hosted uh, over the recent fortnight an inward uh, visit from uh, the Turkish Ministry as well as the ESK. Um, which is the Meat and Milk Board uh, in Turkey, which uh, actually issues a lot of the import licenses there. Uh, we recently worked also with the Department of Agriculture veterinary officials in securing improved access to the Algerian market. Okay, on the capacity issue, and, and uh, we've been dealing with this issue now here, this committee for the past couple of weeks, the whole the future of the beef industry, and, and there would have been some criticism a number of weeks back from, from uh, directed at Borbia uh, as regards not doing enough to address the capacity issue in, in Cherbourg. Is that an issue for yourselves to deal directly with, or is it another area? Um, so again, I'll, I'll address that um, because also I visited the, the, the Lyrages in Cherbourg uh, with my colleagues uh, in, based in our Paris office. Uh, we travelled down and met with those operators, again viewed the, those facilities there last spring. Um, while there was only a, a very minor increase in the actual daily capacity, it increased from uh, approximately 4,000 head per day, uh, a, a slight increase to about 4,500 head per day currently. And that capacity was, was utilised uh, throughout the spring. Uh, albeit that there are just sailings on three shipping days per week, um, in line with uh, the, the, the decision of the ferry companies to sail on those particular days, uh, reflecting their other enterprises, their other trade um, for, for exports. Um, so, 
Chairman uh, Akar here, look, we, we have been in touch with obviously all of the, the various operators here in, in Ireland, the exporters themselves, who, are we, who we are, and, and I myself am in regular contact with them. Uh, we indeed had an inward buyer visit last week uh, from a Spanish customer and visited many of the live exporters. Obviously, we have moved away from the peak exports now at this time of the year, and that capacity issue isn't as much of a... a, 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 a a bottleneck, really, as it was um, in the peak export time of the month of March and early April. Uh, similarly, we are continuing to find opportunities for other categories of stock. Later on in the year, the focus will move more to weanlings and to heavier cattle and, indeed, alternative markets. Yeah, just on, on the same point, though, we're, we're going to have the same volume of calves next spring, and maybe more. Uh, have we, have we the issues addressed that, that have arose this spring that we won't have the same problem next year, would you think? Again, Chairman, the current situation appears to be that the, the two ferry operators, the two ferry companies, um, are continuing to, to look set to, to sail on the similar days, and the capacity issue again seems to, see, seems to be at around the, the similar level. So there is no immediate uh, solution in sight um, that will that will see the numbers increasing dramatically from this spring's level. Um, obviously, taking a long-term approach, uh, we would obviously advise and, and work with all of the various operators in order to look at the supply chain and see if, through breeding, can we breed superior animals also that will be more valuable even for the home trade, uh, be it through increased usage of, of beef crossing. Um, through usage of better bulls. We are involved in a number of other programmes uh, similarly in order to you know, highlight all of the various options that are available at the start of the supply chain through breeding to, to produce a better quality calf, while also recognising that this is a very, very important outlet in order to you know, um, secure markets uh, for particularly the pure male dairy calves. Deputy Cahill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to say that, first of all, that I think Borbia are a great organisation and um, do, do a lot of very good work. And I suppose it might be the last positive thing I'm going to say for a while. So. <laughs> it's it's get out of the way early. But, but um, I don't. But like, as, as the Chairman has said, you know, you produce a document here, again, there's no mention of live exports. And I asked the doll question there about two to three weeks ago. And um, specifically focusing on targets for the last six months of the year as regards life exports, and particularly cattle of six months or over. And I want to know what target had been set for the last six months of 2019. And the minister refused point blank to, you know, that board be it. There wasn't any target being set. There was no figures being, being set for the last six months of the year. And I just, I can't understand that. Like, I, I sat on the board for six years. And like, when, if we got a new market somehow or other, there was always a target on much beef we intended to get in there. We've heard of this market being open for live exports and that market being open for live exports. But the reality is there's very, very little stock moving. And that is the reality. We see an odd time of a boat of 3,000 bulls or this or that, or, and there's a big fanfare, a fanfare about it. But there's no competition at the ringside from live exporters. It's not happening. And while as we, Joe, Joe there, you know, talked about we breeding a better calf to keep it calves at home and we're our calves and sex semen and all the rest. The problem uh, in the back end of this year was our kill reached 40,000 head and the price we were getting is just not viable. I've never seen the despondency among beef farmers that's out there at the moment. And I think, it's, I think it has to become compulsory that when a document is produced by Board B or anyone else on the beef industry, we see you know, the targets growth of 20% in comparison to the baseline figure. I think we have to get one for the primary producer and what the return is per hectare out of beef farming. Because the return out of beef farming has dropped and dropped significantly year in, year out. And one of the biggest challenges faced in the beef industry is our single farm payment. And beef farmers are completely dependent on it, and there's going to be one hell of a battle to, to, to maintain that going forward. And I suppose what worries me most of all in this statement here is, you know, um, the, beef, the beef price in Europe. And, and that, that can't, we can't blame anyone for that, but it, it's, it's the reality we have to face up to. 
Across continental Europe, cattle prices are also behind last year's level, and the, and the average price of our three young bulls at the moment stands at €3.65 per kilo. Like, how has an analysis been done of how the European beef farmer is able to survive at a price like that? Like his costs of production, you know, can't be lower than ours. If they are, there's something seriously wrong with you know the, the way they farm on the continent. You'd imagine the cost of production would have to be significantly higher. And like, if they're able to produce beef, if they're able to produce beef at, a, at that kind of a, a price and make a viable return, we're in a complete cul de sac. So, like, how, how, are, how are their farmers coping with, with a price like that, and how are they able to take it? Now, just on the, you know, you, you, you raised there about the, the, the challenges that have been made against the health of red meat consumption. And, like, the dairy industry um, have a promotional body, the National Dairy Council, whose, I suppose, one of its main roles was to defend and, and, and um, promote the, the, health, the, the health aspects of having dairy in your diet. And I think they've very successfully done that. Like, if you go back 15 years ago, uh, you know, butter, if you touch butter or cheese, it was absolutely detrimental to your health. And uh, I think it was uh, uh, Dr. Nedigan was the first man that came out and said that dairy uh, in a balanced diet was essential, was essential for, 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 the, for your health. And that battle on the dairy side has been, in my view, has been won. And we see, you know, the, 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 the way um, very rarely now you see neg negative comments about, uh, about a balanced diet containing dairy. And does the beef industry need a similar body now to, to, to take on the, the opponents that are there and the people who say that, you know, if you eat a steak, you're, you're hammering a nail into your coffin. So, um, you know, the dairy industry has done that exceptionally well. And does the beef industry need, 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 to, go, need, need to go down, need to go down a, 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 similar, a similar route? Um, you know, the other say, and I just, you're focused on the family farm tradition in Ireland. And, uh, you know, you've spent four million on, on, on this campaign. <coughs> again, again, how much scrutiny would this stand up to now? Like, we've saw figures for January and February there this year, the figures that come out to mind, the amount of the cattle that are coming out of our feedlots, and the amount of cattle that have been um, sold into factories by agents. Like, if one of our major customers came in here and examined our figures, and how many are coming, how many of our cattle now are coming to slaughter from family farms? Like, you know, um, it's going to betray the image, but if some of our opponents um, um, took us on, how, how, how much can we stand over, over that going forward? Like, our, our factories are um, fattening a lot of their own cattle now, and the percentage seems to be growing and growing. And um, again, you know, to set ourselves as, 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 as you know, producing this green beef and a fa in a family farm tradition, uh, you know, how, how much can, 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 we, can, can, we stand, can we stand over that now? And I suppose, you know, the perennial chestnut there, the, the beef classification and the grid, uh, you know, there's huge dissatisfaction out there. And you no, know, technology has moved on. I, I just—I was just reading an article this morning. I think it's 10 years um, that, this, that this grid has been introduced at this stage, and it's 10 years in operation. And um, I, I was quoted in the article. I was—I was as critical of the grid 10 years ago as I am now. So at least I'm consistent in my views of it. But with the advances in technology. Surely, you know, the, 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 the way the, 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 grid, the grid is done, the way the, the, animal, the animal is classified, surely there should, you know, there should be improvements in, in, in that technology. Uh, you know, f the amount of grades that's on the grid is one thing, but farmers, you know, are, are inherently um, unhappy with, with the classification and uh, they rightly or wrongly feel that they're not getting a fair crack of the whip on it. And I know you'll say to me that, you know, Borbee have no role in this, and uh, I accept that, you know, your job is to promote the beef, but it's, it's, it's something there that's undermining farmer confidence out there at the moment. And I think, again, it's something that has to be addressed. Um, you know, if the positive, you talk about beef consumption rising, um, um, especially in, 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 in China and, 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 mark, and markets in China, that consumption is going to rise. I just 
sad figure he said consumption was, I was I was surprised at the figure that consumption was going to grow by more than twenty percent inside inside the next inside the next decade and um, you know that Asia would account for half of this increase. Now you know as regards the first of all what you know Asia would account for half that increase will the Asian will you know will, will they get the same food taste as ourselves? Will the you know the, the top the, the top end quality cuts um, um, be be in demand in those markets, or will it be the lower end of the market that, that the increased tonnage will come from? Because obviously if it is the, the same return isn't there. But you know again, and the other question is, at what kind of a price you know do you think that that market will grow at? Because you know, in a couple of paragraphs down, you talk about swine fever, and thankfully, it's having an impact now on peak prices, and for the you know peak, um, peak producers, and we have only about 360 of them left in the country, but they are getting a break at the moment, and for the first time, I suppose in a number of years, are starting to make a reasonable return. But uh, you know, the swine flu, you know, will, will come and go in Asia. But will that will that market return a price that will be viable for us to, to supply to supply it to? And um, I suppose you know climate change and the, the challenges that climate change um, um, pose for us as, as farmers. Uh, you know we have we have two and a half million cows in, two, in two and a half million cows in the country at the moment, and that that figure is rising. And um, you know we can say we're the most we. The focus on climate change, and you know, it was declared a state of emergency here in the in the, in the Dáil uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, whether we like it or not, we're going to be farming and agriculture is going to be the one of the prime targets of reducing our emission our emissions. And uh, you know how what how the board BSC is win, uh, winning that argument with the general public that you know we can produce this beef from the suckler cows and that we can do it. In a climate, in a climate-friendly um, way, and I think you know that is that is a major challenge that we're facing because definitely there's going to pressure come on um, on, on the agricultural sector to reduce emissions, and uh, how we can convince um, the public um, credibly that um, you know we're producing beef in, in an environmentally friendly way, and how we're going to reduce our our, our, our emissions from from the agricultural industry significantly is, is going is going is going to be a huge challenge. But you know, uh, I said a few points. I said I'm disappointed with the lack of focus on the report on live exports. I'm disappointed that there's no targets for the rest of the year. And like you know, live exports are at a record level. We're talking about the cash at a record level, but the amount of cash on the ground is also at a record level. So it it will have no impact, in my view, on the supply of cattle um, in, in in 2020. The amount of cash we got out, out of the country this <coughs> year. And I, I, the amount of men that have, have, have are deciding to hang up their boots as regards beef farming is increasing rapidly. And I, I would like to focus on the cost of production in the continent, how they can do that viably at 365 a kilo. And, and I, there's definitely there's no economic return for us here there. The family farm tradition, the NDC equivalent, and I suppose the, the, lack, the lack of focus on farming comes in, in presentations. Yes. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you for your contribution. Um, I, again, I, I want to commend Board B on a lot of the work you do. Uh, it's, it's important that Irish agriculture has uh, a structure there for to market the produce and market it worldwide and, and, and bring the focus on to the quality of Irish food and the, the unique way in which much of Irish food is produced. Uh, I think one of the, the downfalls, if you like, or I'm, I'm sure if you're well aware of it, the whole and the whole lot is that the primary producer is struggling so much for to make a living. That's, that's really the focus of what we're trying to, to work through here over the past couple of months, looking at the beef sector in particular. Um, the, the comparisons you give, just to go back to the comparison you give in regard to the, the, the European average and where we are, uh, one of the things that has always struck me is that for the quality that we, we produce, that we're grass-fed, therefore unique, that family farm, which is practically unique as well in many ways, uh, the scale we work at, all of those things in general should put us into a position where we would expect to be getting a premium price back to the, to the, to the primary producer. That's, I suppose, one of the, the core arguments in regard to all of that. Um, the, 
the issue of, of, of how you do that is really what we're at, and, and to try and see what we can do. And uh, all the time, the, the consensus seems to be that the farmer has to get uh, more efficient, has to produce more from less, and that it's up to the farmer to do that. And that means more efficient usually means more intense, and that intensity flies in the face of the market model which we try to market the product at. And that comes to, to Deputy Cahill's point in regard to uh, how we would be able to stand over the situation where probably at least 10 and maybe even up to 20 per cent of our beef at certain times is coming from uh, a, very, a very large uh, feedlot model or, or heading toward an industrial scale model of, of producing beef, which, which I think is detrimental, not just to the, the, model, the marketing model we have, but actually to the, to the actual product itself. And, and I think when I, I'd like to get your view on it, that you, you say that um, the capital throughput has increased by 36,000 head to date this year. Uh, are we at a stage where we would need, in order to correct this, are we at a stage where we would need to see a reduction in the throughput? Should we, should we not be at a point soon where we say, well, continuing to increase the volume, ultimately, from, from where we sit to represent farmers, we're to see that processors and supermarkets are making an awful lot of money out of this extra volume, while the primary producer is making little or nothing out of it, is, is, is not really working to the benefit of, the, of the, the common good, if you like, and that we, we need to, to come back and sit down and, and, and press the reset button and look again at it and see how we can do this better. Uh, I was interested in the, the points you made about the international market and that we were approximately 4% of Irish beef are exported outside of the European Union. Uh, there is huge potential there. I, I certainly don't talk to people about the, the, the Asian market, or particularly the Chinese market, that there, there, is a, there is a view that anything that comes from Ireland is, is of top quality and that they are prepared to pay a very a good price for it and that there's potential there if we can if we can do that properly but I think we can only do that properly if we if we do it for everywhere there's no point in us going to China and say we have a unique product we want to get a top price for it when they look across at Europe and they see that we're only getting an average price there I think we need to we need to be able to find a way of of resetting ourselves that Irish beef will get a pre premium price everywhere it's sold and there I understand there's difficulties with that I'm not saying it's easy but that at the same time, I think it has to become the, the focus, certainly for Onboard B and, and indeed for farm organisations. Everyone has a part to play in regard to all of that. Uh, the, the other issues in, in respect of the bad press that sometimes is given toward beef and beef production in particular and uh, how we do it. Is, is there an aspect of that, and, and I just wonder, because certainly from, from where I come from and my part of the country is, is, is generally suckler cows, and, and the suckler farmer produces one thing, the calf, but they have to keep the cow <coughs> for the whole year for to produce that one calf, and usually the type of land they're on, they can't finish that calf, they have to sell them on to somebody else to finish them. So they are, they're in a, in a huge disadvantage, and I wonder is, the, is there merit uh, in, in looking at alternative models of production? for that region and how that can work out. And I know uh, many farmers are, are going to this thing now where they're rearing dairy calves and on, a, on, a, on a contract basis. And it's, it's working for some people, but obviously that's not the entire solution because it's, where, where is the beef going to come from? But if, if more and more of the beef is going to come from the, from the, um, the expanding dairy herd, how can we stand over that? and how can we produce the quality that we need to produce, and how much work has been done in respect of that, and can that still be able to get the kind of price that we need to see back to the primary producer? Because all of this, certainly from a board B a point of view, has to be about the price back to the primary producer. Uh, I'd also be interested in your relationships with the, with the factories and the processors and the supermarkets and all of that. that um, to, to my mind, and it may be a misconception for many people out there, believe that on board B, you go out and find the markets and make the contacts and put the two sides together and then walk away. And uh, <coughs> we would be of the view, or certainly I'd be of the view, that we, we'd, we'd need to be um, getting, uh, acting, as a, acting as some kind of a guarantor for the primary producer back at home, because it's taxpayers' money that's paying for a board B, for to provide these markets, and if the only beneficiary from the markets is going to be one section of the industry, then there's a, a certain unfairness there. And I think that's, that's we're talking about beef here, but that goes for all sectors, you know, of, 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 of food that comes from Ireland. So I just leave it at that, and thank you very much again for coming in this evening.
Thanks, Deputy. And uh, finally, Senator Lombard. Thank you, Chair. I apologise for missing the uh, first part of your presentation. I'll, I'll, I'll actually I'll call it for vote. Um, first of all, I think it's very important that we have Board B here today. It'll give us a different outlook on where we're actually going to actually beef industry. Obviously, the figures of exports are exceptionally good, and I think that's something we just need to be very, very, um, you know, we have to talk ourselves up in many ways. Could I just focus on two things I possibly could? Um, the actual um, export trade for live animals, and you might talk to me about is there an actual strategy in place regarding Borbia and Borbia's outlook regarding live animal exports itself, particularly wanings and Frisian bull calves? And how does that actually feed into the actual dynamic of ensuring that we have an appropriate market base for our beef going forward? You might also comment on the levies regarding live animal exports and the levies pertaining that were uh, reduced, I think, last year. Um, I think the levy was 450. It's reduced now to 130. I might be wrong with my figures. Um, how do you think that reduction has worked? Has it been a positive impact or a negative impact? Or where do you think the actual levy as an entity is regarding driving the market itself? Um, regarding your focus on marketing, your focus on ensuring that you have enough capabilities to ensure we can get those calves or wanelings, whichever it may be, to a proper home. Regarding the actual industry itself and the major changes we've seen in the industry, in particular my part where we've seen an awful lot of movement from beef, suckler farming to dairy farming. If this trend was to continue over a decade at this level, where would you see your industry or where would you see the beef industry sitting in that scenario? With large numbers of dairy stock, large numbers probably of smaller Angus or beef animals coming on the stream, not your traditional suckler farm, not your traditional suckler um, animal coming onto it. Would you have a fear about the actual marketability of that kind of product at that level of production? If you had large numbers of, let's say, Frisian cull cows, large numbers of Angus, free, Angus heifers or Angus bulls coming onto the system, rather than your traditional suckler herd itself. And would that have a knock-on effect in the entire industry then? So I'm just wondering, the long-term plan, because there has been a shift in numbers, there has been a shift in emphasis, I'm just concerned that we do market our beef, and it's the lovely picture of the suckler cow. Will we have that suckler cow in 10 years' time? And if we don't, how do we market the actual product then? So I just want to get clarity. Thank you, Chair. And yes, I apologise missing the start of the debate. Okay, no problem. Mr. McCarthy. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Um, that's a fairly broad range of, um, of, of questions, and let me perhaps just put some structure on it. Um, if I can talk first of all, and, and we'll, we'll kind of put them in, in clusters perhaps is the best way to answer them. Um, if I can talk first to uh, Deputy Cahill's concerns on the, um, the attacks towards beef versus um, on the grounds of health and the idea that the dairy industry has successfully managed or, or navigated this. I'd probably challenge that analysis from the perspective that the attacks are coming from three different locations to both sectors, and they're coming not just from health, but they're coming from the environmental impact, and they're coming from animal welfare. And I would respectfully argue that dairy is being challenged just as hard as beef is in those topics from different angles and different suggestions around them. I would absolutely stand over the fantastic work of the NDC, but I don't think the battle has been won by any manner of means. Um, I do think that there is a challenge to all of the industry to be able to articulate its benefits much better, whether that's the job of a brand new agency or, for that, or whether that's the job of the current um, infrastructure that's already there, i.e. The, um, well, that's the farming organisations being very articulate and being able to defend their patch, whether that's the Board Bia being able to defend its role and being able to provide data to them, mm -hmm. whether that's the meat industry and the dairy industry themselves, and that's also providing um, expertise from dietitians and coordinating that messaging, there is definitely a job to be done because there is without doubt a coordinated campaign attacking the animal protein sector, I'd suggest, and I would group both of them together rather than separating that one has done better than the other. I think they're both equally vulnerable on this. Um, then if I move on to the, um, the, the climate change um, discussion, and indeed I would suggest that if we didn't have Brexit 
um, that is one of the biggest challenges facing our sector, the only thing we would ever be talking about is the challenge of climate change because they are two um, huge challenges facing our industry or two th huge threats that uh, challenge the very existence of our industries. Um, absolutely acknowledge the, the state of emergency, but that state of emergency, I'd suggest, is coming from the market as much as it's coming from uh, this building, from the perspective of the, the job that we mm -hmm. have to do. And if you do uh, look to acknowledge the fact that um, so many of our farmers and our industry signed up to Origin Green was actually a very, very strong indication of how much that uh, has been taken to, to heart. And that infrastructure has been designed and developed since 2012 to the fact now that we have 52,000 farms on board, we have 90% of our exports, we have 95% of our dairy industry, our dairy farms on board. But what we have at present is a very, very strong infrastructure to collect data and what we now need to move into is the improvement that's happening on farms. Now obviously there's been a lot of work and there's a lot of technical expertise uh, that is driving the improvement here, be that um, looking at the MAC curve and the fantastic work that Tagusk has done in this space, but what we can without a doubt uh, flag and flag very continuously is that there is a huge obligation on Ireland right the way through its industry to be able to illustrate the improvement that it's making to justify its existence, never mind its expansion, to do towards that topic. And I'm not saying that that's easy, but I'm saying that it's only by a coalition of looking and aligning at all of the targets and the challenges that we have to do collectively rather than segregating them apart. Um, if I look at the questions around the... Um, I might ask Padraig to talk through about the, the industry structure and the, the feedlots, etc., that were yep. mentioned. Uh, Deputy Cal, maybe if I start on the, on the live export side of it, uh, first of all, in terms of our targets and that, I suppose, just to be clear from the very outset, we would view the livestock sector as being vitally important to the viability of any beef sector that we have in Ireland, and that will continue to be the case. While I, I do agree we don't have definitive number targets down there for the rest of 2019, as you suggested, Deputy, Really what we're focusing on internally and what we're doing is our targets about how many buyers can we attract into Ireland to look at Irish cattle and Irish livestock with a potential business opportunity down the track in the various markets, whether that's in Spain, Netherlands, Italy, uh, Turkey, Algeria, as Joe mentioned. It's about how we can actually undertake activities on the ground locally, if you like, to make them aware of the capability of the Irish livestock industry. Uh, to supply what they're looking for in terms of the category and type of animal that they need. Some of that work can sound like a little bit distant at times, but ultimately it's really important because in a lot of these markets there's lots of other competitors as well that we have to say, well, what's different about Irish livestock? And that's a really important part of what we do uh, as an organisation. I think as well as that, while there's always a lot of focus on calves, and rightly so, particularly in the spring of the year, a lot of our focus will be on the other categories of animals as well in terms of weanlings and stores and looking at opportunities for growing that business because I think collectively uh, we need all those categories of animals to have a number of outlets whether that's live or dead and, and I think absolutely I, I think we would maybe have expected a slightly uh, more rapid increase in numbers of live or cattle exports over the last year or so but the fact that last year we saw a 20% increase year to date this year we're up 36% again in numbers shows albeit with the challenges that Chairman, you highlighted very clearly at the outset, still exist. We are making progress in terms of the number of animals that are actually uh, being exported off the island, and hopefully uh, we can continue to do that in conjunction uh, with the livestock uh, exporters as well. In terms of the price viability across the European Union, you quite rightly highlight even today as we sit here, Irish beef prices are 104 per cent of the European 50 on average for our three young bull prices. Uh, there's a viability issue right across the European Union. Yeah, I, I think you would say some uh, countries, some producers definitely have a slightly lower cost of production than we would have, given maybe more proximity and more availability of feed uh, and uh, the young bull system that they would have. But viability is a major challenge right across the European Union uh, for, for the beef industry. So I think uh, it's not unique to Ireland by any manner or means, and, and all we can do uh, in terms of the markets and the customers that we're trying to find is how can we deliver the best price that we can. And I think if you, if you look at this decade, six of the last eight years we've been at or above the European average. You go back to the year 2000 to 2009, we're only at or above the European average for one year. 
So we are making some progress in that regard, and I wouldn't say for a moment that there's not a lot more to be done. There absolutely is, but at least there's signs that we're moving in, in the right direction on that one. In terms of the family farm structure and the whole discussion around feedlots as well, uh, the data that we'd have, and Joe, you'd be a little bit closer to this side, the data that we would have from our quality assurance database would show that we have about 580 farms that slaughter more than 300 cattle per year in our system. Now, based on the information that we get at audit, it's very clear that on the vast majority of those farms, they're not feedlots by, in the international definition or anything close to it, in that there's a strong outdoor production focus, there's a long grazing season in most cases, and in many cases to have that feedlot status or a slaughter-only policy because of the TB status on that herd. So it's very difficult to know exact numbers that, are, that would be in what you would define as a feedlot, but certainly our information would suggest the vast majority of the farms that might be classified as that are actually very representative in terms of the production system to farms that wouldn't be classified that way as well. In terms of the grid, uh, you know Deputy Cal, you were involved at the very outset in terms of the discussions that happened around this. The whole purpose was the grid was designed to be a reward for quality. Uh, and uh, I suppose reflecting what the market was looking for at that particular time. But like everything, uh, things move on and markets change and evolve over a period of time. That grid is now more than 10 years old. And I think certainly I would welcome the discussions recently about maybe is it time to review the grid and look at that. And I know that has come up in a number of, of quarters over the last while. And maybe now is a good time and an opportune time to look, given the change and maybe dynamic that we see in the beef industry in terms of where our beef is coming from. And it would be a good opportunity maybe to do that. In terms of looking outside of Europe then, Deputy, uh, you quite rightly highlighted the, the growth and importance of Asia as a region. And certainly that 20% figure that, that's quoted there is very much import demand rather than, than overall consumption. And we, we are likely to see at least that level of increase between now and the year 2027. You raise a very valid point in terms of their taste requirements or, or their appetite, if you like, for the cuts that we would typically tend to, to export. And you take a China, for example, absolutely there's a different uh, set of cuts, if you like, that are more popular in that market. But I suppose there, there's two ways that we'd look at that. Number one, a market like China offers an opportunity to deliver a better return for some cuts that otherwise can, can garner a very low return in the European market. That's an important element to add overall value to the animal, if you like. The second is, and we've seen it again as recently as last week in China, that the, the, the demand and the, the demand for some higher quality cuts is also increasing in, in markets such as China, and, and then next month we'll be in Japan and Korea, and we'll see exactly the same trend. So there is a very high value part to those markets as well. We're probably at the very early stages. Uh, the first product from Ireland only arrived in China last September. So we're still only six, eight months in to developing that trade in that market. But the one thing that struck me in China last week, and we've all heard a lot about African swine fever uh, over the last number of months, which is obviously a very grave issue uh, for, for China itself. But one thing is clear to me is it's going to have a structural impact on that market for a prolonged period of time. Uh, the people locally that I was talking to were looking at a, a structural impact probably for the next five, seven years at the very least. This year alone, the most recent forecast would suggest they're going to produce 18 million tonnes less pig meat in China. That means they're going to need to find to import that equivalent. And the reality is whether you look at chicken, you look at pork, you look at beef, from any other producer in the world, that volume of product doesn't exist. So you're into a situation in a market like China where there's going to be an absolutely uh, strong demand for a prolonged period of time for beef and for pig meat. That has to present an opportunity for us, albeit we're at the early stages of development in that market. It presents an opportunity to us to really establish ourselves in that market in the way that we'd like. And I think as those markets evolve and as those markets grow, they have the potential to deliver a better overall return for the animals that are produced. And obviously that goes back to the primary producer then in terms of the price that they, they can achieve as well. Uh, in terms of, of some of the other questions then, and I don't know, you can pop back in, in terms of the price levels. Uh, and you're quite right, uh, Deputy Kenny, in terms of our grass-fed production, our outdoor production systems. They are unique strengths. 
and they are strengths that we rely on the Sustainable Beef and Lamb Assurance Scheme for us to have the facts and figures to back that up. But in, in any market we go into, <coughs> excuse me, we are an import supplier. So it can take time for us to maybe make the most of those strengths. But the first thing we have to have is we have to have the facts and figures at our fingertips to demonstrate that it's not just a photograph, it's not just a statement, that we can back up every single thing that we're saying to that customer. Then, and I think you mentioned earlier on about the relationship we have with the customers then, do we just put the processor and the, and the customer together and walk away? That's the direct opposite of what we do. And I think in terms of, Tara, you outlined our, our revised marketing strategy for beef. That's all about how we get close and stay close to the key customers that we have to try and build a profile and build a position that Irish beef can secure with each of the key customers that we have. Because you may start at a certain level with a customer, but there's potential to grow that volume and grow the value of that business over a period of time. So more and more of our investment will be going on, going into working with individual customers to try and increase and improve the profile uh, and the position, indeed, of, of Irish beef with them. So it's absolutely not about securing the business and, and walking away or facilitating the business and, and walking away. I, I think you raised a very valid question about do we need to reduce output, uh, Deputy Kenny. And I think really for, from our point of view, and you look at the dynamics that are happening in the global market, we are going to see increased demand for beef globally. We're going to obviously have a more mature market closer to home in Europe, but how, where we focus and how we export our beef is going to change. And I think in terms of managing the output that we have, as Borbea, our focus is on ensuring that we have as many markets and as many customers as we can possibly have open to and consistently buying beef from Ireland. That helps minimise or, if you like, reduce the risk then of that higher output that we've seen for a prolonged period of time uh, over, over the last number of months. Uh, I might, uh, se Senator Lombard, or, sorry, no, Tarsi. No, no, I was just going to say, uh, Senator Lombard, on your questions around the, the strategy for livestock exports, I might leave that to my colleague, uh, Joe Burke, to deal with that. And if I can just add mm. two, two points mm. to Paul Drake's comments on the, um, the beef consumption in China as well. One of the things that I think is really important to remember here is we do not have a strategy of trying to westernise the diet of China. Mm. What we are actually trying to do is ensure that Irish beef is a position within um, Chinese recipes and designing how they cook their food and how they can then cook Irish beef as part of their recipes. We will have um, four master chefs coming to Ireland next week where they have custom designed different regional cuisines from Cantonese cuisine, etc., mm. on how they would cook the Irish beef cuts that are available in their market and then to propagate that into the Chinese market more frequently. So what we're looking to do is not to say eat a steak because that's what we do. What we're looking to do is look at their recipes and ensure that our cuts match their recipes. We we believe that's with the funding that we have available a more efficient use of it and has a much longer term gain to it as well. And also just to build on, on Podrick's point with regard to our relationship with supermarkets, we also look for cross-sectoral opportunities so that when we speak to a supermarket, be it on dairy, we look for an opportunity for beef, be it on beef that we look an opportunity for seafood, so that we're continuously looking at Food Brand Ireland and all of the opportunities to cross-sell into the market or to cross-promote to make sure that we get that broad access to buyers rather than limiting ourselves to one sector and limiting our conversations to one sector. And that's been one of the benefits of our cross-programmes, be that our Origin Green Ambassadors that we place into key accounts. We learn from them as much as anything else. A new initiative we've taken from a talent perspective is by placing um, our assets, if I may put it like that, so professionals that we're working with from a in, through a student network with University College Dublin, but that we place them with our accounts. And what I mean by that is we have our supply chain students placed with Tesco, with Marks and Spencers, with um, Sodexo, with Sainsbury's, to actually understand better how their supply chain works, how their decision making works, and that we can then bring that intelligence back to industry to make sure that Ireland positions itself very, very well in those challenges. Similarly, we've done that in sustainability through our Origin Green programme, placing, again, mm -hmm. our assets into their businesses, be they customers or non-customers, but they are always thought leaders so that Ireland uses an opportunity at every point to inform itself of what the best in class are thinking about as well. So I just want to add that on the live exports, uh, Joe. Uh, Senator Lombard, just to um, 
I suppose to tackle your first point in relation to the live export trade. Um, is there an actual strategy to maximise live export numbers? Our focus would tend to be uh, to look at the markets, to look at the categories, um, to pro provide the market insights uh, to the commercial exporters themselves as regards the potential that exists within those markets, uh, to meet with new contacts as well too within those markets, whether they be um, mature or existing markets for calves or the likes of the new international markets and gaining market access through uh, the efforts as well too of organising trade missions in, in conjunction with the Department and the Minister. Um, and coordinating inward buyer visits as well too, where possible, has been a useful vehicle in order to, to uh, kickstart trade in some of these markets. Um, so, in terms of, of, of specific numbers, um, while some of the markets are volatile, including, for example, the likes of Libya, um, that had appeared to, to be opening up and presenting new opportunities. At the moment, it's more volatile as a result of really the, the difficult, um, you know, really a, a war-like situation taking place over there, which is limiting the opportunities. Even the likes of Turkey as well, too, would take a, a political decision, uh, which they are currently doing at the moment, and basically not uh, not um, allowing any imports or, or suspending the issuing of import licenses. But even the visits that we've had from Turkey over the last few weeks has given us hope again that they look set to issue uh, licenses again and to open up imports. But we have the contacts now in place in order to, to maximise the opportunities then for the Irish exporters. With regard to the levy, so the Department of Agriculture levy, which is more the, the veterinary and the, and the, uh, the sign-off on the uh, on the clearing of the animals for export, that has been reduced from 480 down to 120 per calf. So I know that that was following some uh, some lobbying as well too in recent years, and of course that had a significant benefit. Every lorry load of calves or truck load of calves um, that leaves the country is approximately 300 calves. So that's a, o over a thousand euro of a, a net saving to an exporter as a result of the reduction in that levy. With regard to board B as levy, uh, there is a marketing levy on all bovines of one euro ninety per calf or per uh, per live uh, bovine animal exported. Um, so obviously that is quite significant also over all of the animals that are exported that will amount to more than 500,000 euro um, of a budget of a contribution uh, as a result of, of live exports and indeed we invest that then on behalf of the livestock sector in the, the various activities that I discussed including the market insights as well as the promotional activity. Um, so that is the, the situation in relation to the Borbia levy. Um, in relation to the suckler herd then, which is the, obviously a key area of focus um, because we have uh, taken on board with interest um, the, the, the trend in recent years of decline. We saw 45,000 head decline in calf registrations to sucklers last year, 35,000 head for the year to date this year, um, and obviously more animals coming through the system of a dairy background. And suckler really is, is part of our, our uh, point of difference, part of our unique selling point of Irish beef. You obviously see a lot of suckler-based animals in board B as marketing material in our promotion of Irish beef. So it does resonate well with buyers when we bring in customers and it tends to be a focus of ours to bring them to a suckler farm where they see uh, the commitment of the farmer to breeding good stock, uh, to, to bringing those animals through the system and obviously the, the positive attributes then of that system, including uh, the welfare related benefits of having animals with their mothers for six to eight months at grass. And indeed we have brought uh, those benefits um, to uh, the, the level of applying for an EU promotional campaign. So we have the campaigns taking place in Asia, which are more about, I suppose, discovering the potential of these markets, uh, utilising um, funding that is available through the EU. Um, but this is another opportunity to actually, and we have applied for this funding. That is not to say that you know it's, it's guaranteed to be successful or anything like that, but. Um, you know, in order to, I suppose, maximise the benefit of the suckler herd, in particular, we have seen the opportunity which exists within the Italian market and the German market. Um, so we've applied for this campaign for suckler beef, um, and you know, we would see this as being potentially uh, useful, hopefully, uh, if we're successful. Um, but of course, 
um, we have seen in recent years that on balance, uh, on average, we only have been successful in about one in four of these applications. Um, but in this case, we used our consumer research uh, in these markets in order to target affl <laughs> affluent consumers uh, who would represent an ideal potential customer for this type of product coming from that animal of a high welfare, uh, sustainability type background um, with those unique attributes uh, that it would resonate well with. Can I ask it? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 no. In like 10 years' time, profile is going to change dramatically if we're going to continue on these numbers. Like you mentioned, uh, 35 um, less uh, uh, registrations last year, 35 this year. That's a continuous trend. Would you have a fear? Would you have a fear in a decade's time with that continuous trend that your ability to market Irish beef at that level with that kind of suckler cow entity as being the main focus will have a major detrimental impact on the beef industry itself? Yes, so obviously, Senator Lombard, that would be a significant decline were that to continue. We would hope that, you know, the we have seen, obviously, very difficult market conditions, not just as a result of the drought conditions last summer, which had an impact in certain parts of the country. Obviously, the price levels as well, too, that prevailed and the difficulties there had a knock-on impact as well, too. Um, so we would hope that uh, the, the situation would be, would be more stable. Um, but the influence that we can bring on that being um, hopefully the, the best possible market returns as a result of our efforts, as a result of our promotional campaigns. One of the initiatives that we've put forward has been this EU promotional campaign application. Our ambition would be to drive the highest possible returns and the, the highest profitability levels back to the producers, which, which still exist in 10 years' time. We can't say whether there'll be 900,000 cows, 800,000 cows, um, but obviously we want to have the most sustainable um, producer background and for those producers to be making a living out of it ultimately. I, and could I just clarify regarding your interaction with the actual exporters? There's no um, so-called export association set up at the moment for live exporters. I think there's up to 15 or 18, I'm not sure the actual number of live exports working at the moment. Do you think that's an impediment to you, not having one single point of contact as a so-called organisation that represents them? And would that, if that entity was set up, would that be a better way for you to engage and to work with them? So, thanks, Senator. That, or thanks, uh, Senator. That is a good question. Um, board B, uh, on our meat and livestock board, we have a representative um, who is himself a, a live cattle exporter. Um, so that is one of the means that we have of making sure that we are relevant and addressing the needs of the live exporters. Individually, as we do with our beef clients, the live exporters receive uh, individual support with regard to the specific markets and the categories that they are interested in. Uh, we have encouraged the exporters as a group to come together to form an association. We would see benefits to that with regard to their engagement with, for example, the Department of Agriculture in the prioritisation, indeed, of markets, of market access. Uh, so, yes, it is something that we have been encouraging them to move towards. Obviously, there will be some individual and, and, and differences, be it competitive or otherwise, um, but we would hope that they would be able to come to some arrangement to, to put a, a mechanism in place, as you describe. Thank you. Any? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just one other point I forgot to make in the, in, in the first uh, round there was, in regard to the, the department has a scheme there for producer groups, for groups of farmers to come together, for to work together to produce, um, I, I suppose, both to market their product and for their inputs and for all of that. I just wonder, have, have you, do you work with any of those producer groups to find markets for them, or do you have a sector that focuses on that specifically? Or what potential do you see there, where you'll be talking about perhaps a group of farmers looking for a niche market, a particular area, and providing for that? And what kind of structure can we put around that to protect them from the big guys as well, if, if that's necessary in the future? Thank you. Just a very brief question. I do apologise. We had to go for votes, and then I was called somewhere else. Um, I, just looking at the, the pig and poultry sectors in terms of vertical integration um, between the industries and the producers, why is beef so slow to have proper um, vertical integration 
so that we could have a more sustainable situation for farmers? Um, with regard to producer groups, it's a model that's very sophisticated in the mushroom industry already, and we would engage very significantly with those producer groups um, in the coordination of their marketing. Um, it allows us to draw down funds um, with regard to European promotions as well that are then matched because you then have an industry funding grouping. Um, so we would be very, very comfortable with producer groups and working with them. We're actively coordinating or actively um, helping different sectors to, to look at that as a model. Clearly within um, horticulture we have a slightly different remit because of board glass and have a, a stronger producer responsibility than perhaps we do um, with regard to the coordination of that type of activity, but we would endorse it absolutely as providing a very strong model um, to allow uh, smaller producers to, our, to, to bring scale to their offering and to coordinate themselves to receive market messaging back and also to be able to coordinate funding. For example, in preparations for Brexit with those producer groupings in, in horticulture, we were able to look and introduce lean into them as a pilot and then allow them to explore that within their, their own infrastructure to get that best practice model um, accelerated into their businesses as well. So we would be huge endorsers of that as a, as a model going forward. Um, uh, thank you and, and, and uh, for your question, uh, Senator. With regard to um, vertical integration, it's a very different business model with regard to the cash flow funding involved um, and to the business model that Ireland has when you look at land usage, when you look at the infrastructure um, associated with vertical integration versus family farms and the grass-based production system that Ireland has. When you're looking at pig meat and poultry, it's very much uh, intensive industries that our beef industry wouldn't be that closely aligned to. Um, there, there have been, I guess, closer cooperations on production models that have been piloted and investigated where you've had contract, man, uh, contract suppliers um, with different uh, beef producers, uh, the, the KK Club with Keepak would come to mind, or even the new uh, 2020 um, model that uh, Glanbia and uh, again Keepak are looking to explore. And whilst it's not an absolute vertical integration, it does look for a further alignment of from start to finish, mm. sending much clearer messages but you have a very strong industry structure within our beef industry, which is family farms, which is um, looking towards the, the fragmented nature of that industry as well, I guess, um, and the working capital that would be involved to finance for the number of years involved as well would be quite different from the speed to market that you'd have in poultry. So it's a, just a very different industry structure. You do have it in the US, um, but that's in a feedlots um, play rather than having it in a grass-based extensive production that we have here in Ireland. I just think unless we address the dis disconnect between the farmers uh, and the producers then we won't have we, we won't have that model. You know, Senator, without a doubt the viability of our farmers mm. is an absolute core um, priority for I think everybody in the room here today and I guess what we're looking to continuously is to challenge ourselves and are we doing the best that we can do to capture value from the market, to send coordinated messages to make sure that there's coordinated and alignment that Ireland doesn't leave any value on the table behind it when it's talking to the market. Um, there are many other structural issues to the industry um, that fragmentation is never your friend when you're looking to, mm. to, to create that scale. Um, and, you know, we, we would always be open to new ideas and there's obviously only certain remits that Borbia has within that, um, which is about the marketing of this and to send market signals back to the industry, but absolutely would, um, would agree with you fully on the fundamental future of the industry is based on the viability of the farmers that are working in it. And, and just very finally, do, I mean, do you think what's happening, and I think there are exciting developments, and I want to commend you on the work you do internationally um, in terms of China and Asia, but do you think it's going to be uh, quick enough, if you like, for the, the British situation and the non-tariffs and what's that going to, what, what that's going to lead to in terms of the flooding of the shelves with um, South American beef and Senator, the, um, and we mentioned this very, very briefly, and, yeah, and we haven't I, I talked that much about Brexit forward, yeah. um, in the course of today, mm -hmm. but we, we were mentioning that Brexit to us, um, between Brexit and climate change, are the two huge issues facing the fundamentals of our industry. 
Um, and to be absolutely frank, I don't know when the end of Brexit is going to be. Is it going to be October or is it going to be longer? If it's October, no. The answer is Asia will not be mm. ready to take uh, 300 or 200,000 tonnes of Irish beef by October. Mm. Absolutely not. Um, it wouldn't have been ready by March either. You know, mm. we, we had market access um, to China since last April. The first product arrived in September. But, you know, we're, we're talking... Um, under 10,000 tonnes, it's 4,000 tonnes. It's not hundreds of thousands of tonnes that are um, growing in that. And I know, uh, Deputy Kenny, you mentioned that Ireland has a fantastic reputation. It does in certain categories, but our beef is not known in, in, in Asia for the most part at a scaled level. And that's because we're brand new. No European beef had access to that market up until we got access to that market. So they, the concept of beef from Europe is a very, very new concept to them that we have a lot of work to do to build. And if you're asking me categorically, will they take 200,000 tonnes in the next two, three years, mm. I'd have to say no. Um, there's no forecast that would give you that. However, in the longer term, and, and this is the, 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 what we're trying to look at, Asia is providing very, very strong signals to the floor of global prices. And that is a positive for us, because when the floor of global prices rises, then there's a benefit for European beef to be able to explore those new opportunities. And it also provides other outlets for South American mm. beef as well. Mm. But that doesn't, and I wouldn't in any way look to say that the idea that we would be out of the UK market would in any way be compensated by anywhere else. You see, that's why there needs to be government um, intervention to do to fill that gap, because otherwise we're not going to have any family farms left or the farms as you described. So even if it's on a temporary basis in terms of a suckler cow premium, that uh, that is the only way I can see of uh, of filling the gap. And I do, you know, we wel would absolutely mm. welcome the, the 100 million that's been talked of from, from Europe and the support that's coming through. Obviously, again, it's outside of our, um, of our remit or our, our mm. expertise on, on the, um, the, the distribution of that funding. Um, but as I said at the beginning, we would be absolutely committed to the sustainability of the, the sector farmer. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, that completes our, our business today. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. As you know, we're ongoing, this ongoing process that we have. Next week's our last hearings uh, where we have two other groups coming in. We hope to complete our report by the second week in June. Your contribution today will be invaluable to our report. It's a huge sector, as we've outlined here today. It's hugely important for rural Ireland in general. And it's important to have a sustainable industry there for the future. So hopefully, our report will be, provide some kind of a roadmap for the future uh, going forward. So again, thank you very much for your contribution here today. There is no further business meetings adjourned until next Tuesday, the 28th of May at 3.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.